This lecture covers the topics of fluid and electrolyte imbalance. There's a lot of information that's going to be covered over the next almost three hours as we discuss this stuff. The reason that is so extensive, you're going to feel like you're overwhelmed, and I do apologize for that. The reason that is so extensive is because this is something that you're going to use throughout your nursing career. You're going to use it in every class that you're here in nursing school. Knowing and understanding fluid light and electrolyte imbalance is going to be vital to your nursing career. It affects our patients. It affects a lot of the nursing interventions that we perform. Um, one strategy you might want to do is break up this lecture, listen to it in segments. Uh, you need to figure out what your learning style is. If you, some folks choose to print off the lecture and make study cards with that. Some folks um, choose to listen to it in different segments and they go back and re-listen to certain pieces. Some individuals want to listen to it and make notes while they're listening so you really just got to figure out what strategy works for you i would encourage you to get a comfortable seat find yourself a snack or something and then sit back and let's learn about some fluid and electrolytes so the first thing i have here is just a little um diagram that shows you we've got to have in order to have homeostasis we've got to have a balance of our fluid and our electrolytes. As humans, we like to live a balanced life. Too much or too little fluid or electrolyte can result in severe damage to our organ systems or even result in death. Um, as nurses, our job is to help prevent, treat these electrolyte and fluid um, imbalances and disturbances and to teach our patients ways that they can prevent and treat these different imbalances for, um, from occurring. So the main thing is homeostasis. We've got to have balance um, to sustain life. So homeostasis is necessary. And to maintain homeostasis, you have to have a balance in your fluid and your electrolytes. So now, let's review some of our fluids here. We have different types of fluids, as you know. There's intracellular, which are fluids found inside the cells, and extracellular, which are fluids found um, outside of the cells. Now, typically 60% of adult weight consists of fluids, which is our water and our electrolytes. So 60% of the weight that we have when we step on those scales is fluid. Individuals who are older or obese tend to have less fluid because adipose cells does not contain very much water. So that's an important thing to note here. If you're older or obese, you tend to have less fluid. So those people are at risk for having a deficit in their fluid. Now our muscles, skin, and blood all have high amounts of fluid in them. Most of our fluid is found inside of our cells, primarily in our skeletal muscle cells. One third of our fluid is found on the outside of our cells. Now on the outside of our cells, this is where we have our intravascular spaces, interstitial spaces, and transcellular spaces that you see there. Our intervascular spaces, that's fluid inside the vessels, like our plasma, for example, is fluid inside our intravascular space. Now this makes up about six liters of our blood volume. Three liters is plasma, and three liters is erythrocytes, leukocytes, uh, thrombocytes, all of our blood cells. So we have about six liters of fluid inside our veins. And of that six liters of blood volume, half of it's plasma, which is the liquid, and the other half is the, um, the, the blood cells and stuff. Now, the other half of the volume comes from the blood cells. Now, our interstitial space, that's, about, that's the fluid that surrounds our cells, like that's our lymph tissue. Because remember we said our, our adipose tissue does not contain um, fluid. But so our interstitial, our lymph cells, they have about 11 to 12 liters of fluid. And then our transcellular space, which is the fluid that surrounds our cellular space, like our cerebral spinal fluid, our digestive secretions, interocular fluid, the fluid that's actually in your eye, 
that's about one liter of um, fluid. So extracellular fluids are transported. <clears throat> uh, they help transport electrolytes and other substances such as enzymes and hormones. So that the purpose of our extracellular fluid is to help transport our electrolytes and our enzymes, our hormones, and that kind of thing. And so just so you know the difference, there is a difference um, when you're talking about fluid. And it's important to note because um, when you're talking about nursing management of these clients, your patient may have a lot of fluid extracellular, but they may not have any fluid intracellular inside the cells. And your patients may actually be dehydrated. So they're dehydrated. They have a fluid volume deficit when they have three plus, four plus pitting edema. Now, the reason that occurs is because all the fluid is in the extracellular. But remember we talked about intracellular at, um, versus the extracellular. In our extracellular, that's only a third of our fluid. So if all of our fluid's on the outside, then, then what our other two-thirds has been depleted. So we are technically are dehydrated. But we tend to look at what we see. So we just look at... Um, our observation and our assessment and see that our patient has three plus pitting edema. So we're going to say, well, they're in fluid overload. But when you start to look at their lab results and stuff, they actually may be dehydrated. Their fluid's just in the wrong places. So that's just an important nugget to keep in the back of your mind as we're going through this. So our next slide I've got here, um, I want to talk about isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. Now there are different types of um, solutions that we give our patient. What you see here is a picture actually of a red blood cell and this shows you what happens to a red blood cell when they're in each of these types of fluids. The first one is a cell in an isotonic solution. Now this um, in an isotonic solution, which is our normal saline, 0.9% saline, what we hang on our patients. When um, we hang that, you see our red blood cell, that is a normal red blood cell. It's got that kind of concave um, look on the inside. That's the way a red blood cell is supposed to look. But when you take that same cell and you put it in a hypertonic solution, which means it's got more concentration, hyper, more. Um, then the cell, you see there, it starts to shrivel. You see there? It's shrinking, shriveling, and it's changing its shape. Now, hypertonic solutions are like our 3% sodium chloride, which means we got more salt in them. And another hypertonic solution, which you may um, give at some point in your clinical experience um, here in nursing school, is albumin. Now, albumin is a protein, but it's liquid, and it goes inside your vessels and your and your intravascular spaces. And that's actually a hypertonic solution because it has it's very concentrated. And then hypotonic solution. You see what happens to our red blood cells here. Well, can you see the difference between the first picture and the third picture? The cell becomes swollen in a hypotonic solution. It starts swelling because what happens is the inside of the cell is more concentrated than the outside, so the fluid goes inside the cell. The way fluid likes to um, move is on a concentration gradient. Now that's something that you should have already learned in anatomy and physiology, but remember how things go from a level from a, a lower level to a higher level or a higher level to a lower level. Well, what's happening here is this cell is inside a solu hypotonic solution that's half normal saline. Well, the cell, the fluid is going from a lower level of concentration to a higher level of concentration inside the cell. And so the cell's getting bigger. That red blood cell starting to swell. So we really have to be careful when we're giving our patients um, those hypotonic solutions like the half normal saline. Now sometimes you'll see in the hospital patients, especially if you're on the surgical floor, doctors will give them something called D5 half normal saline. So they're not giving them complete normal saline, but they're giving them 
D5, which is more concentrated, so they're kind of mixing a hypertonic and a hypotonic, two different substances, and so they're making a solution that provides more volume for the patient. So essentially, it becomes like an isotonic solution because it's a combination of a hypertonic and a hypotonic um, substance. And you'll see D5 half normal saline given a lot in the hospital. Um, but when you see the, the strictly hypotonic solution of the, of the half normal saline, the 0.45 solution, we got to be careful with that because that can cause patients to develop edema. Because what will happen is we'll be giving them this fluid and then it'll want to migrate out to areas of higher concentration. So it seeps out of our cells, it seeps out of our vessels, and it can cause a lot of swelling. The other patients that you want to be really careful with giving this hypotonic solution to is our um, neurovascular patients. Because if you give um, neurovascular patients hypotonic solution, it can cause them to have increased swelling in their brain. So you really got to be careful with kidney patients, heart patients, and neuro patients when you're in speaking in terms of the hypotonic solution because you see what happens to your cells there they start swelling so and think about your tissue starts swelling your brain starts swelling you have edema in your feet it's a good replacement for volume um, but you got to be really careful where we would want to give a hypotonic solution is, is a person that has got like high levels of sodium so if you've already got high levels of sodium we don't want to give you more sodium we want to give you something more like water or a half normal um, saline solution that will be more beneficial to you than the concentrated sodium solution so that's the difference between isotonic hypertonic hypotonic I challenge you to go and look up different forms of these solutions because there are many forms I've just given you three examples today the isotonic being the normal saline the hypertonic being the 3% saline or the albumin and the hypotonic solution being the half normal saline or 0.42 0.45% normal saline okay so here's a question for you isotonic IV fluids are fluids with a total osmolality close to that of most extracellular fluid. ECF is extracellular fluid. Okay, most IV fluids contain either dextrose or electrolytes in water. When you infuse electrolyte free water intravenously, what happens? A. You never infuse it, it rapidly enters the red blood cells, causing them to rupture. B. You give it when the patient is severely dehydrated. C. When the patient is in excess of electrolytes, example if they're hyperkalemia. Or D. When the patient is deficit of electrolytes. So when would you give patients water? IV. IV water. Just IV water. Not isotonic fluid. Not hypotonic fluid. Not hypertonic fluid. So when would you give patients um, free water IV? I want you to think about that for a minute. And we'll continue to the next slide and give you the answer. The answer is A. IV solutions contain dextrose or electrolytes mixed in various portions with water. Pure electrolyte free water can never be administered by IV because it rapidly enters the red blood cells and causes them to rupture. Remember in the picture um, two slides ago that we talked about when we saw the red blood cell in a hypertonic solution well that was water with some saline in it and you see when the saline was cut in half the cell began to swell now imagine if we take that saline away that cell can actually swell and rupture and burst and the reason water enters it so rapidly is because it's going from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration so um, we never give anybody water IV anytime we give somebody an IV solution it's either got to be have um, uh, dextrose in it or electrolytes mixed in it so we never give them strictly water Okay, so here's a, <clears throat> a diagram that I wanted to share with you. This is actually for our visual learners. 
Um, I wanted to kind of show you how we take in water and how we get rid of water because that's going to be important when we're talking about fluid regulation. So um, in this picture, the first cylinder, it shows you our average intake per day, per day. And the second cylinder shows you our average output per day. So let's, let's first um, talk about, we take in fluid through our food, through our drink, and actually through metabolism. We actually take in fluid. And then we lose fluid through our elimination, sweat, skin, and through our lungs when we breathe. Now, when fluid is lost, um, we have to replace it in some way. Now, this diagram actually shows you, uh, typically most of our fluid that we um, get per day comes from our beverages. About 1,500 ml of our fluid per day comes from what we actually drink. And then another 750, so half of that comes from um, our foods that we eat. And then a uh, final 10% of our fluid comes from actually our metabolism. Um, and then our average output, we lose most of our fluid through actually urination. Typically, um, the average adult urinates about 1,500 ml a day. And then the other portion we lose through our skin and through our lungs when we're breathing. Um, and that's about 700 ml. Did you realize that you lose that much fluid just by breathing? I mean, it's fascinating actually. And then we lose about 200 ml through sweating every day and then we lose about 100 ml in our um, feces. So that's about 4% of our intake, our output goes, um, leaves us through our um, feces. But so um, when fluid is not lost from our body, but it is not available for our body to use, what happens to it? Because sometimes <clears throat> we have fluid, but we can't use it. Well, what is happening is the fluid moves into our spaces that does not help our body maintain homeostasis. Now, this is called third spacing. And I know you guys have probably heard the term already, third spacing. You see that a lot with your burn patients, your, really, your trauma patients. Um, even surgical patients you will see maybe see third spacing with. So third spacing causes an intravascular volume deficit because the fluid is in the wrong places. For this reason, a person can have three to four plus pitting edema and still be dehydrated. Remember we were talking about earlier on, on the first couple of slides when we discussed um, maintaining that fluid and electrolyte balance. And I, I was talking about how a person um, could not have anything intracellular or extracellular. It goes into those other spaces. It moves out into the spaces that doesn't help our body. It moves out into that adipose space. Uh, it, it starts to leave us through our skin. So when it moves out into those spaces, the person can have three to four plus pinning edema, but they're still dehydrated. And what actually is occurring is that they're third spacing. Now, I want you to think about um, any cases that you've had so far in clinical, and what patients do you think typically would have problems with third spacing, typically have that swelling, be that end up dehydrated, but then they look really swollen. Um, one that comes to mind for me is liver disease. Those patients have a lot of ascites in their abdomen, but they're really dehydrated. Another one is cancer. You're gonna learn about this, that this semester too. Um, with your cancer patients, this third spacing can occur because they have malnutrition. Malnutrition is another reason that this can occur. And if you can't absorb your food, you can't absorb the fluid. Where is it going to go? It's going to go in those extra spaces. It's not intracellular. It's not extracellular. It's all those extra spaces that we really don't need our fluid, where we really don't need our fluid to go. Another place you'll see this is with burn patients. Um, and then something that you guys might have encountered so far in the clinical setting is immobile patients. A lot of times if your patients are just laying in the bed, after they've been in the bed for one day, they're going to start swelling. They're going to have some edema in their lower extremities because they're not moving. They're not circulating that blood. Unless they've got on like SCDs or something that's causing that um, muscle uh, 
um, stimulate that muscle contraction. But they need to be getting up, need to be moving, or they're going to be um, starting to develop that third space and in those extra spaces. So um, if you are assessing a patient and they've been in the hospital for two or three days and they've not been out in the bed, I guarantee you you're going to have some edema on your assessment. So this is just for your visual learners so you can see where our fluid comes from and where it goes. So now I have a question for you. So to see if you remember from the picture that I just talked about, what is the average daily urinary output in an adult? Is it half a liter, one liter, one and a half liter, or 2.5 liters? Remember from our picture? So now let's go to the um, answer. Next slide. The answer is C, 1.5 liters. <clears throat> Vital to the regulation of fluid and electrolyte balance, the kidneys normally filter 170 liters of plasma every day in an adult, while excreting only 1.5 liters of urine. So our kidneys filter 170 liters every day, but we only get rid of a 1.5 because we use some of the other stuff. Isn't that crazy? So now it lets you think, if our kidneys filter 170 liters of plasma, what if they're not working? What happens to our patients? What if they're in renal failure? Does that get filtered? Where does the fluid go? Does it get eliminated? The kidneys aren't working. They can't, they can't make that urine, right? So you see now why the patients in renal failure have severe electrolyte disturbances and swelling. Here's another question for you. You're working on a burn unit. Remember we talked about burn patients. One of your patients is exhibiting signs and symptoms of third spacing. We just talked about that. Which occurs when fluid moves from intracellular space, intravascular space, but not into the intracellular space. Based on the fluid shift, what would you expect your patient to demonstrate? So, let's think about it. Your patient is losing fluid, but it's not going into the cells. It's going where we don't need it. Are your patients going to be hypertensive? Are they going to be bradycardic? Are they going to be hypervolemia? Or are they going to be hypovolemia? Hypervolemia is too much fluid. Hypovolemia is dehydrated. So what's going to happen to this patient? Remember, we talked about third spacing. What happens? What are your patients at risk for when they start third spacing? So now let's go to the answer. Third spacing fluid shift occurs when fluid moves out of the intravascular spaces but not into the intracellular spaces, causing hypovolemia. Right? Remember, we talked about your patients can be dehydrated. Hypovolemia is dehydration. So hypertension, bradycardia, and hypervolemia are not indicators of third spacing. And actually, it, think about it. If you lose fluid in your vessels, do you lose blood pressure too? That answer would be yes. You've got to have something fluid inside your vessels to have a blood pressure. So if you have a decrease in your fluid, you have a decrease in your blood pressure. So you would have hypotension, not hypertension. And then so if your blood pressure is low, what is your heart going to do? Your heart says, wait a minute, I've got to beat, I've got to perfuse. So it wants to be faster, right? It wants to be faster so it can get more volume, so it can get more perfusion. So instead of bradycardia, you'll have tachycardia when you have this um, hypovolemia. So that's just some key points there for you to take away because I remember I said you can learn from getting the answer wrong because there you've just learned about hypovolemia, you've learned about um, hypotension occurs with hypovolemia and tachycardia occurs because it's all related to perfusion. You've got to have something inside your vessels in order for you to have a blood pressure. Okay, and let's continue on. Now, fluid regulation. 
Now this is something that's really important. Now this goes back to your pathophysiology. And I know that Miss um, Jacobs has been going over some pathophysiology with you. I just want to take a second here to go over a couple things just to remind you. This is just a reminder here because you've got you should have gotten all this in your uh, anatomy and physiology classes. But a couple of things I want um, you to recognize, some terms I want you to recognize and, and remember is diffusion, osmosis, filtration, remember that sodium potassium pump, and hormone regulation. Now I've included a nice diagram here for you um, visual learners um, that talks about uh, our fluid regulation and what happens um, when, our, when our sodium goes up, our blood volume goes up, our blood pressure goes up, our atria gets stretched because that's our heart. That's where our heart is pumping our blood. And then um, you can see there, uh, I've got the key. You got the terms there, the atrial natriuretic peptide, atrial natriuretic factor, cardiac output, CVP, um, blood mary filtration rate, heart rate. You see your key down there at the bottom so you know how to correlate with your um, your diagram there. So I wanted to put that there for your for you visual learners, but I want to talk about each of these individually for a minute. This is going to be kind of a long slide, but I want you to really take some notes here. So diffusion. What is diffusion? Diffusion is transport from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Now diffusion is important in the transport of most electrolytes and cell particles um, throughout the membrane. So when you think of diffusion, think about your electrolytes. They're going from higher concentration to lower concentration. Now osmosis is actually the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. So that means water is going from higher concentration to lower concentration. Now filtration, what filtration is? Filtration is caused by hydrostatic pressure in our capillaries. Our fluid is filtered out of our intravascular compartments to our interstitial compartments, right? So we want the fluid to go that we give our patients. We're giving them IV fluids right because we want them to be hydrated right we need them to have perfusion so we're giving them IV fluids but this fluid has got to be filtrated so we can use it well remember we talked about what filters it our kidneys are our filter so our kidneys filter our plasma every day and remember we said earlier that our kidneys filter about 170 liters of plasma every day which means they're continuing to filter because we don't have 170 liters in our body and i want you to get confused here thinking oh my god we've got that much fluid inside of our body no we don't have 170 liters but the filtering process is continuous our kidneys are continuing to filter so when they get a cycle done they start over they're always filtering we're always taking in fluid we're always getting rid of fluid throughout the day so but the hydrostatic pressure in our capillaries is what causes this filtration to occur and then the sodium potassium pump sodium potassium helps to rate the pump helps to regulate sodium and potassium in the cells through diffusion so the sodium and potassium pump help regulate our work with the the process of diffusion but they regulate our sodium and potassium because we have more sodium outside the cell sodium wants to go into the cell diffusion and then we have more um, our intracellular volume is offset because where sodium goes guess what water goes so when sodium enters the cell and moves outside the cell, that's done through diffusion. So we really have to be careful. That's why we got to have that sodium and potassium pump to keep us regulated so that our cells don't get overwhelmed with sodium and overwhelmed with water or, or vice versa. We don't have too much sodium outside, too much water outside, and then we have that um, edema that occurs. So we can either, we can have too much or not enough. So that sodium potassium pump keeps that regulated for us because they work in an opposing relationship. Now hormones also help us with fluid regulation. One hormone that you probably remember is aldosterone. You remember that from anatomy and physiology? Aldosterone, you see that here in the diagram here? 
Aldosterone is released by your adrenal cortex. Where's your adrenal cortex? Do you remember? That is actually found in your kidneys. Your adrenal gland is the gland on top of your kidneys. Right? So you're releasing aldosterone. What about antidiuretic hormone? Do you know where that's found? In your pituitary gland. So that's released in your brain. So now we have that aldosterone. We have um, adrenal antidiuretic hormone. We have natriuretic peptides. Right? Those atrial natriuretic peptides that help with that release of um, fluid regulation. Now, the thirst mechanism is an example of how osmosis and hormone regulation help maintain homeostasis. So, for example, your body is dehydrated. But our body likes to correct those problems on its own, right? We really have a really great system because we want to maintain homeostasis. We need balance. So what happens is our brain signals our body that says, you're thirsty. So you'll take in more fluid. So you won't be dehydrated. Do you see how that works? That hormone says, oh, you're thirsty. You need to drink something. And so you're stimulated to drink. So that's how the hormones help to regulate your fluid balance. The feeling of thirst is caused by the activation of cells in your brain. That is in response to our change in our osmolarity. Now, uh, just to keep these things in the back of your mind, keep these things in the back of your mind, if you've got a decrease in your... Um, Oh, angiotensin 2, that's another factor there. That's related to your kidneys too. You see that the suppression of the um, RA system and the angiotensin 2, which is the renin angiotensin system. If your kidneys, the hormones there, if they're not working um, and you're not getting that fluid uh, filtration, you'll have less blood volume, decreased CVP, which is central venous pressure, which is pressure inside your heart. Decreased cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that your heart's pumping out. Decreased atrial pressure, which is the pressure, blood pressure found in your arteries. Decreased preload, which means um, the work that your heart has to overcome. And a decrease in your heart rate. So all those things, if there's a um, decrease in the suppression of it. And then if there's a decrease in your um, aldosterone release, in your adrenal cortex, you have an increase in your urine production of water. If you have an increase in your glomerular filtration rate, if you have an increase in your sodium excretion, so if you're getting rid of sodium, you're going to have an increase in your urine production and water excretion because water follows sodium, right? And so if you don't have a lot of volume, what happens? Remember we said, if you don't have a lot of volume, what happens? Your heart rate. Can, can go down, but it can go up initially. Your volume, your output goes down. Your blood pressure goes down. Your CVP goes down because you're not getting as much perfusion. So all these things are related. So um, this just go. This is just a diagram to show you. You can study this a little bit more. We could spend all day talking about the pathophysiology of fluid regulation, and that's something I'm sure Miss Jacobs is going to cover with you, and that um, you have gotten in your anatomy and physiology class. And if you have questions about this area and this topic, I challenge you to go back into your anatomy book and look up this process of diffusion and osmosis because you really have to understand this in order to really understand your fluid and um, your fluid regulation with your electrolytes. So this is vital, this is important. So I challenge you to go back and look because it's all connected. This ties in back to your heart, perfusion. This ties in back to your kidneys, um, renal. This ties into your lungs even. Um, so everything's connected and none of your organs can work without perfusion. So it really affects every one of your organ systems and it's important for the sustainment of life. So take a look at this diagram. Go back and look in your textbook if there's things that you're still not sure about. Um, even pull back those anatomy books to look through these topics because you really do need a good foundation in this fluid regulation. So now let's talk about some gerontological considerations. Remember we talked about in the beginning, the um, older client, they have less fluid. So they have reduced 
homeostatic mechanisms for cardiac, renal, and respiratory function, right? Because what's happening, their organs are getting aged, so, so they're getting older. So they're getting tired, they're not, they have a decrease in their function level, right? So these people are at risk for dehydration. They also have a decrease in their fluid percentage. We talked about that before too. And then they're on some medications. What if they're on a medication that's a diuretic that's causing them to release fluid? What if they're on a medication that causes them to retain fluid? What if they're taking too much salt into their diet? What if their taste buds have been affected? So now things don't taste good to them, so they have a lot of salt intake into their diet. So these are some things that we really have to um, be mindful of when we're taking care of these geriatric patients because they may other have other conditions too that also affect it. Like they may have lung conditions, they may have heart conditions, you know, they may have those kidney conditions, they may have wounds, they may have diabetes. So. Um, just some things to consider, just keep in the back of your head, especially when you're thinking about fluid and electrolyte, is those geriat that geriatric population. So here's a question for you. You're a nurse caring for a 77-year-old male who fell off his roof. You note that the patient's labs indicate minimal elevated serum creatinine levels. So your serum creatinine is minimally elevated. What can this indicate in an older adult? A, substantially reduced renal failure. B, reduced respiratory function. C, increased cardiac function. Or D, alterations in the ratio of body fluids to muscle mass. So what does your serum creatinine assess when you're looking at serum creatinine? And in the older adults, if it's elevated, if your creatinine is elevated, what can this indicate? So now let's go to the answer. A, remember we talked about serum creatinine is your kidneys. Think about your kidneys. Normal physiologic changes of the aging adult include reduced cardiac, renal, and respiratory function and reserve as alterations in the ratio of body fluid to muscle mass. They may alter the responses of the elderly people to fluid and electrolyte changes and acid base disturbances. Renal function declines with age, as do muscle mass and the daily exogenous creatinine production. Therefore, high normal and minimally elevated serum creatinine val um, values may indicate substantially reduced renal function in the older adult. So it's normal for the adult to have um, decrease in their kidney functions. And you may see um, elevations in their serum creatinine levels that indicate that they've got reduction in their renal function. So just keep that in mind when you're looking with your older patients. It may not necessarily indicate that they're in renal failure because, you know, we tend to associate elevated serum creatinine with renal failure, but it may actually just be a, a process of their aging with these patients because, because their renal function is decreased in the older adult. So here's another question for you. You're doing an admission assessment on an elderly patient newly admitted for end-stage liver disease. You must assess the patient's skin turner. What should you remember when evaluating skin turner? A. Overhydration causes the skin to tint. B. Dehydration causes the skin to appear edematous and spongy. C. Inelastic skin is a normal part of aging. Or D. Normal skin turner is moist and boggy. So we're thinking here about assessment and we're thinking about skin, and we're thinking about our elderly patient. So let's look at our answer. Next slide. The answer is C. Inelastic skin turgor is a normal part of aging. Dehydration, not overhydration, causes inelastic skin with tinting. Overhydration, not dehydration, causes the skin to appear edematous. And normal skin is dry and firm. But now, the thing you have to remember when we're dealing with elderly patients, so they may normally have inelastic skin turgor. So it may not be a sign of dehydration with them, but they're at high risk for dehydration, right? 
So we have to be careful when we're monitoring them. We may need to look for other signs of dehydration besides their skin turgor with the elderly patients because inelasticity is normal. So, with our fluid volume imbalances, and we've already hit on this a little bit, because I've, I've already spoken the terms hypovolemia and hypervolemia, but you either have too much fluid or not enough. So if you don't have enough, you have a fluid volume deficit, not enough, and that's called hypovolemia. So, and the way I remember it is hypo, when I think hypo, I think a low, hypo, low. So, hypovolemia is not enough, it's low. Anything that's hypo is slow and low. Now, when you think of fluid volume excess, too much fluid, you're hyper, or you've got too much, I think of excitedness. Like when pay, uh, children get hyper, they, they're excited. They've got a lot of energy, got a lot of it. So, they've got too much energy. So, too much fluid is hypervolemia. And that's the same process that works with your electrolytes. If you have hypercalcemia, you've got too much. So, that's the difference. Remember, hypo is not enough. Hyper is too much. So, now let's talk about fluid volume deficit. What is fluid volume deficit? Fluid volume deficit is the loss of extracellular fluid that exceeds our intake. We, we lose more than we take in. Remember that picture that I showed you several slides ago of the diagram of your intake, how we take fluid in by drinking, eating, metabolism, and how we lose fluid by um, urination, sweating, breathing. And so you see, and, and our feces. So you see there, if we are losing more than we're getting in, then we're getting a deficit. We've got a deficit if our output is greater than our um, intake. Now, electrolytes lose loss in the same proportion as they exist in the normal body. So if we're losing our electrolytes, then we've got a deficit of our electrolytes. Dehydration is the loss of water along with an increased serum sodium. So we can lose water and have a fluid volume deficit, but we become dehydrated when we lose water and our sodium level starts going up. So remember that. Dehydration is loss of water and our sodium level starts going up. And then this may occur in combination with other imbalances. And I just want to stop here for a minute. When when we're dehydrated, remember we talked about our brain signals us that we are thirsty, right? That we need to drink something. Well, what do we what do we go and drink? We go and drink a soda, right? What does soda have? Soda is full of sodium. So if we're dehydrated, and remember we just learned that if you're dehydrated, that means you've lost water and you have an increased sodium level. So if you're dehydrated, you don't have enough fluid, you got too much sodium, and then you go and drink a soda, guess what happens? You become more dehydrated. Instead of fixing the problem, you're actually making the problem worse. You're making your sodium level go up. And what happens? Your sodium goes up, you start losing more water, losing more water. So it may occur in combination, this dehydration could occur in combination with other imbalances too. You may have a potassium imbalance. You may have a calcium balance. But one thing I want to encourage you, especially that you're in nursing school, so what are we drinking? Those Red Bulls, we're drinking those sodas, um, so we can have all that caffeine to stay away, and we're not eating good, we're not, we need to be drinking water. When you get thirsty, you need to drink water, you need to drink something that's going to replenish your, um, your fluid, but that's not going to elevate your sodium level. So, so keep that in mind. And that's the education piece that you need to make sure that you're teaching your patients. Because when we're thirsty and we drink that soda, we're not doing nothing but making ourselves more dehydrated. So let's talk about what causes dehydration. Dehydration is caused by fluid loss from vomiting, diarrhea, suctioning, sweating, like when we're exercising, working out, a decrease in our intake if we're not taking a lot in, because how do we get fluid by our foods? An inability to gain access to fluids. We, we may a flu, um, fluid. We may have uh, medications or something that's on board. We may have a malabsorption issue. 
that can cause dehydration. Um, it may be, remember, that liver patient or something. Um, and then risk factors include diabetes insipidus, adrenal insufficiency, because what is that? Adrenal gland, our hormone, it, ad adrenal cortex, um, it secretes that um, aldosterone, remember, adrenal gland, aldosterone, osmotic diuresis, we're just diuresin, diuresin, diuresin um, water, hemorrhage, um, bleeding, coma, and third spacing. All these things can cause you to be dehydrated. And remember we said with third spacing, you could be really edematous, really swollen, and still be dehydrated. And uh, you guys, I'm not sure if you've got into the patho of diabetes insipidus or not, but when you have diabetes insipidus, those patients can lose three to six liters of fluid a day just by urinating. They have a, a deficit in their hormone with their pituitary gland, and so they, their antidiuretic hormone, they, they keep excreting. They keep excreting urine, excreting urine. So these patients become really, really um, dehydrated because their sodium level goes up. And with the diabetes insipidus, their sodium could be 160s, 170s. They have to be really careful. These patients need to be drinking water all the time, checking their sodium. And they'll take a medicine called... Um, uh, AD, AVP, which is the hor stimulated hormone that they, it's a nasal medicine that they um, squirt in their nose that stimulates that hormone so that their their brain will say, okay, wait a minute, quit, quit getting rid of these fluids, quit getting rid of these fluids, and it'll help that sodium level. So these people have to really be mindful of um, becoming dehydration. And also what you'll see with this diabetes insipidus is these patients may become swollen too because they've got all that sodium, but it's in the wrong places. So keep in mind, your hormones play a big factor in um, dehydration, as you see here. And then obviously with hemorrhage, you're losing fluid. You're losing blood. You're using, losing your plasma. So you're at risk for becoming dehydrated because when you're hemorrhaging, what's inside of your blood? Your sodium. So you're losing sodium. I mean, you're, you're, um, you're losing your plasma, you're losing your potassium, you're losing all of your electrolytes. And our body tries to compensate with that. So our sodium leaves outside of our cells, so we have higher concentrated levels of sodium as a result of the hemorrhage as a compensated mechanism for our body. So you'll see that with patients a lot. So we got to really be careful with those trauma patients and burn patients and renal patients. So now here's a question for you. Dehydration in the elderly is a problem that is all too common. What causes dehydration in the elderly? And this is a select all that apply. So I want you to think about this for a minute here. Is it A, decreased kidney mass, B, increased conservation of sodium, so we're thinking about dehydration in the elderly, C, increased total body water, D, decreased renal blood flow. E, decreased excretion of potassium. So, think about it. What causes dehydration in the elderly? And remember, we said dehydration is what? Loss of fluid with an increase in your sodium. But now let's think about it with our elderly. The answer is A, D, and E. Now, this was a hard question because I was actually thinking that you guys were going to pick B as an answer choice. But dehydration in the elderly is common as a result of decreased kidney mass, decreased glomerular filtration rate, decreased renal blood flow, decreased ability to concentrate urine, inability to conserve sodium. Inability to conserve sodium in the elderly and decreased excretion of potassium. Because remember, our sodium and potassium, they have like an opposing relationship. And then decrease in a total of your body water. So therefore, B and C are incorrect because when you're in renal failure, you can't conserve sodium. So that makes that answer choice um, invalid. And then um, answer choice C was an increase in your total body water. And we know that our patients um, our elderly patients don't have an increase, but they have a decrease in their total body, body water. So really dehydration in the elderly is surrounded by the kidneys, by the kidneys not working, by the kidneys being decreased in your mass, by a decrease in your function, a decrease in your blood flow. So remember I said you can learn from the wrong answer too. So I challenge you to really look at this um, 
and this is specific for our elderly patients, but uh, I just wanted to provoke your thought there for a minute. So let's continue. So fluid volume deficit. How do we know our patient is in fluid volume deficit? What are some things we're going to see? Well, one is they'll have a weight loss because they're losing fluid. And remember what we said? 60% of our body was fluid. So if you've got a deficit of fluid, you're going to have a weight loss. A lot of times when um, we, go on, we go on diets and we start seeing pounds start falling off instantly, what that is is actually we're losing fluid in the initial phase. We're losing fluid from our, what do we say, skeletal muscles. That's where most of our fluid is found. So we start losing those fluids when we exercise and stuff. We lose that fluid. You'll have a decrease in your skin turgor. Remember we said dehydration causes a decrease in your skin turgor. It, it can tint. But what population do we have to be careful for with this? Our elderly. You'll have oliguria. Do you know what oliguria is? Remember when you were doing your assessment pieces? That's a decrease in your urine production, a decrease in the amount of urine. So they're still producing urine, but they're not producing enough urine. And remember, how much did we say that the person should produce in a day? 1.5 liters, 1,500 mLs of urine should be produced a day. And when we start seeing our patients produce 300 or less, we start getting worried. They start having that oliguria. And then concentrated urine. Our urine becomes more concentrated. What, what happens to our specific gravity level? Hmm? Remember, uh, have you looked at your urine specific gravity? You need to start looking at your labs because labs are important related to your reduction of risk potential. So, so what happens to our urine specific gravity when our urine becomes more concentrated? We tend to have postural hypotension hypotension because what's happening not enough volume remember we said we don't have enough volume so our blood pressure goes down well when our blood pressure goes down what happens to our heart if heart rate goes up because what's going to happen it starts beating more we have a weak pulse because it's beating fast but it's not beating effective because our body says wait i gotta get i gotta work i gotta work that heart starts pumping 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 trying to compensate we'll have an increased temperature our skin may be cool and clammy because of vasoconstriction. Because what's happening? You don't have a lot of fluid. So our body says, wait, heart's got to have it. Lungs got to have it. Brain's got to have it. So our peripheral extremities, they vasoconstrict. So shoo, all the fluid goes straight to your heart, your lungs, your vital organs where you need it the most. So if you don't have any perfusion on your extremities, then guess what happens? They become cool. They become clammy. You may get thirsty. Remember we talked about thirst. You may begin to develop nausea. You may begin to develop muscle weakness, cramps, because what else is happening? You're losing volume. You're losing electrolytes. So what are we going to see in our labs? I really want you guys to really look at your labs. Start looking at your labs. Pay attention to your labs when you're going to clinicals. This is only going to help you. Whenever you um, look at your labs, say, well, why is this happening with my patient? And why is this elevated? Why is this decreased? And start correlating that with every patient that you have. So you'll be more astute to what laboratory data is, what it means, how to interpret lab data. Because lab gives us a lot of information. So with a fluid volume deficit, we'll see an elevation in our BUN. Uh, in relation to our serum creatinine. So our serum creatinine goes up, our BUN goes up. We'll see an increase in our hematocrit level. So why do you think hematocrit level becomes increased with fluid volume deficit? Is it more concentrated, you think? We'll see an elevation in our serum osmolarity. Now one way that I remember this is osmo, if it's um, if it's high, you're dry. So if it's elevated, you're dry. And all these things, elevated BUN, elevated hematocrit, elevated osmo. So I think high, dry. If it's high, you're dry. You've got a fluid volume deficit. So that's one way that I can remember when I go to look at my lab values. And if I look at my BUN and it's elevated, my um, osmo is elevated, then I know that my patient's probably dry. They're probably dehydrated. They've got some fluid volume deficit going on. And then the last thing is our serum electrolytes. You may see changes in those, and that really um, 
is going to be based on what else is going on with the patient. Are they are they urinating too much? Why are they losing volume? Is it because they're not taking in enough volume or because they're getting rid of too much volume? Or is it because of a diabetes insipidus? Remember we talked about um, with diabetes insipidus, they're, they're dehydrated but their sodium is high. Are they getting rid of potassium? Are, are they on a... Um, a diuretic that's not potassium sparing. So if they're getting rid of urine and they're getting rid of potassium, they're dehydrated and their potassium could be low. So so there's a lot of things to consider here with um with your electrolytes and your fluid volume deficit. Now here's a question for you. What is the major indicator of extracellular fluid volume deficit? So how do you know? How do you know that you've got a fluid volume deficit that you that you're dry in your extracellular spaces is it because do you have a bound in pulse do you have a drop in your blood pressure do you have an elevated temperature or do you have pitting edema how do you know so let's look at the answer the answer is b there is a drop in your blood pressure okay Fluid volume deficit, signs and symptoms include, remember we talked about this, weight loss, decreased turgor, oliguria, concentrated urine, orthostatic hypotension due to volume depletion, weak rapid heart rate, flattened neck veins. Remember if you're overhydrated, you'll see that JVD that you learned about in assessment. Um, increased temperature, thirst, decreased or delayed capillary refill, that's another sign, delayed capillary refill, delayed perfusion not enough volume. Skin's cool and clammy because of white vasoconstriction. Decrease in your central venous pressure, which is the pressure in your heart. So you don't have enough volume to put in, you don't have a lot of pressure. Pale skin, anorexia, nausea. Clinical manifestations of fluid volume overload result from ex expansion of your extracellular fluid, including edema neck vein distension, and crackles. So if you've got too much fluid volume, then you're going to have that edema, that crackles. That, so if you've got fluid volume excess, fluid volume overload, you're going to have that, um, it starts to affect your lungs, because where's the fluid going to go into your lungs? So you're going to have that drop in your blood pressure. Because we talked about that, no fluid, no pressure. Continue. So fluid volume deficit, what do we do to fix it? How are we going to treat these patients? Well, your doctor is going to order you to give them fluids. And the way we give them fluids is by oral fluids and IV solutions, right? So some oral fluids that we want to encourage are what? Well, we talked about not sodium. Not sodas because of the sodium level. And then IV fluids we want to give them. Do we want to give patients that are, have a fluid volume deficit a hypertonic solution? Do we want to give them an IV solution that's got a lot of sodium in it? No, we do not. So if you've got a fluid volume deficit, we've got to be really careful with our IV solutions. Now, we also have got to be careful with our renal and cardiac patients. If we give them too much fluid too fast, then we can send them into renal or cardiac failure or both so we really have to be careful with these patients when we're talking in terms of um, medical management and taking care of these patients so the oral fluids we can encourage our patient to drink we should be in there every two hours when we're around on our patient every hour we should be offering them something to drink and we need to be calculating how much we're giving them we need to have a accurate intake and output on these patients when they've got a fluid volume deficit. We need to be recording that. How much are they putting in? How much are they putting out? Are they putting out more than they're taking in? And we want to encourage them to drink. Offer them something that's good to their taste. Maybe they don't like water, so they're not going to drink water, but you got to find that happy medium. you got to find what works for them. And then um, you got to have a good IV. If they're dehydrated, they may not have good veins. So you got to really make sure that you're monitoring that IV too to make sure that they're getting that IV solution. Okay, so here's a question for you. 
While admitting a new patient to your medical surgical unit, you know that the patient is oliguric. Remember we talked about what is oliguric. You notify the <clears throat> acute care nurse practitioner who orders a fluid challenge of 100 to 200 ml of normal saline solution over 15 minutes. What do you know this intervention will do? A. Will it help distinguish hyponatremia from hypernatremia? B. Will it help elevate the pituitary gland function? C. Will it help distinguish reduced renal blood flow from decreased renal function? Or D. Will it help provide an effective treatment for hypertension induced oliguria? So now this is a question that I'm, I'm challenging you with. I want to provoke your thought here because you really have to think. They're, they're not getting a lot of fluid. Now this is a patient that's oliguria, means, which means what's going on? They're not <clears throat> producing a lot of urine. So the practitioner is trying to figure out why the patient is not producing urine. So the practitioner says, let's give them 100 to 200 ml of saline over 15 minutes. So they're not giving them a lot of fluid. Because 100 to 200 ml is not a lot of fluid over 15 minutes. So why do you think that they're doing this? What do you think they're trying to figure out? Look at your choices again. And remember I said you can learn from getting the answer wrong too, but I just want you to have this knowledge. This is important to know as a nurse. So now. Okay, now let's look at the answer. The answer is C. If a patient is not excreting enough urine, the healthcare provider needs to determine whether the depressed renal function is a result of decreased blood flow, which is fluid volume deficit, or... Um, pre-renal azotemia, which is um, a problem with the kidneys. So is it related to a problem of perfusion, basically, or is it related to a problem of the kidneys or acute tubular necrosis? That's a kidney problem. That's necrosis, cellular death of the kidney. And that comes by a prolonged fluid volume deficit. So so we're trying to think of, is it a kidney problem or is it just we don't have enough volume? Now, the way that they do that is they challenge them with fluid. They'll administer 100 to 200 ml of normal saline over about 15 minutes. The patient that has a fluid volume deficit but has normal renal function will automatically produce more urine. And their blood pressure will go up. So that um, so option A is incorrect because laboratory exams are needed to distinguish hyponatremia from hypernatremia. Option B is incorrect because a fluid challenge is not um, useful to the, um, evaluate the pituitary gland. Again, that's where we're assessing that level of hormone. And then option D is incorrect because a fluid challenge may give you information regarding hypertension-induced oliguria, but it's not an effective treatment for that. So what we're trying to do here is determine if it's a kidney issue or if it's just a fluid issue. So what they'll do is they'll just challenge them with a little bit of fluid at first. Because remember when I talked about earlier with a fluid volume deficit, you have to be careful in renal patients. If this was a renal issue and not a fluid issue and we dumped a lot of fluid on them, what we'll do is send them in failure. So the prudent physician and the prudent nurse goes slow, analyzes it first, assesses it first, and then if it's it is a volume, if it is a true volume issue, if they start producing that urine output, if their blood pressure starts going up and we know that it's a volume issue, then what we can do is give them more fluids. But if their blood pressure doesn't start going up, if they don't produce urine, then we know that it's probably a kidney issue and not a fluid issue. So then we want to give them more fluid. And if um, you think about it, no, we don't. If we give them more fluid, we'll send them into more failure. We'll cause them to have more fluid retention. Um, we'll create another problem. So you'll see this out in practice, especially when you work in the... Um, more acute critical care environments that when you have a patient that's not producing a whole lot of urine the doctor wants to know why is it because they don't have the fluid to produce the urine or is it because their um, organ that filters and produces that urine is just not working
So remember I said you can learn from these answers. Even if you don't know the correct answer, you always learn. That's why the rationale is so important because you've just learned something now. So now let's talk about what are we going to do as a nurse to manage these fluid volume deficits. Well, one thing we're going to do is record I's and O's. I and O is so important when you're talking about fluid. You want to make sure that they're taking in enough, um, that they're not putting out too much, or vice versa. Uh, then vital signs. Why are vital signs important? Because why? If you've got a fluid volume deficit, you're at risk for what? hypotension so we need to be making sure that we're monitoring those vital signs that heart rate because we don't want our perfusion to be affected by this fluid volume deficit because that means our heart's not getting enough blood our lungs aren't and we're not getting the oxygen and electrolytes and stuff that we need another thing we knew is monitor for symptoms with these patients we want to monitor them for symptoms because remember assessment assessment is the key so we're always watching for symptoms we're looking at their skin and tongue we're looking at their turgor we're looking at the um, mucous membranes um, urinary output we're looking at their mental status what happens when we get dehydrated especially in the elderly population don't they begin to get confused confusion is a big sign of um, infection and dehydration in the elderly so assess that mental status and then we want to um, implement measures to minimize our fluid loss like for example if they're hemorrhaging we got to figure out a way to, to stop that from um, hemorrhaging if they're um, urinating and it's because of that diuretic um, that we're administering them maybe we need to see risk versus benefits here oral care why is oral care so important because remember if you're dehydrated what happens to your mucous membranes they become very dry well if they become dry and cracked guess what can happen bacteria that's in your mouth infection can seep into your bloodstream so oral care the purpose for this here is to prevent infection from happening and then administer oral fluids we definitely want to encourage fluids but we want to encourage the right fluids remember how we said that the wrong fluids can make the problem worse and then administration of uh, parental fluids what I'm saying there is IV fluids that's your normal saline that's your D5 half normal saline so we're going to give them IV fluids to complement their oral intake because at first they may be so dehydrated and weak they may not take in a lot of fluids or the fluids that they do take in may not be enough so we need to complement that with some IV therapies and the doctor will write your order for your um, your IV fluids so now here's a question for you the home health nurse is visiting an 84 year old woman living at home and recovering from hip surgery the nurse notes that the woman seems confused and has poor skin turgor when asked about her fluid intake the patient states i stopped drinking water early in the day because it's just too difficult to get up during the night and go to the bathroom now this is very common with elderly patients so what is the nurse's best response in this situation a i will need to have your medication adjusted so you will need to be readmitted to the hospital for a complete workup b limiting your fluid can increase imbalances in your body that can result in confusion maybe we need to adjust the timing of your fluids c it is normal to be a little confused following surgery and it's safe not to urinate at night d confusion following surgery is common in the elderly due to loss of sleep so you guys have even just learned about um, surgery and surgical patients this um, semester so this question can be very relevant for you think about all the things that you've learned and the things that you've just discovered from this fluid and electrolyte piece and put all that together in your thought processes for this question so i want you to take a minute and think about it and then we'll go to the next slide and you'll get the answer the answer is b in the elderly patients the clinical manifestations of fluid and electrolyte disturbances may be subtle or atypical for example fluid deficit may cause confusion or cognitive impairment in the elderly remember i just said that when an elderly patient um, dehydration can cause confusion in the elderly patient option a is incorrect there is no mentions of medication in the um the stem of this question 
um, or any specific evidence that the need for readmission is even required. That's overanalyzing. That's thinking way too much into it. Options C and D are incorrect because confusion is never normal, common, or expected in the elderly. Now, the thing um, is not expected in the elderly after surgery. Okay, your person should not be confused. It's not normal or common for them to be confused after surgery. Sometimes the elderly patients will be confused after surgery because of anesthesia, but that confusion should um, wear off. The other thing with your elderly patient is if they have comorbidities, remember we said there are other things that the elderly patients are dealing with, like um, uh, comorbidities such as Alzheimer's. If your elderly patient has Alzheimer's, Assessing them for confusion may not be the best thing to determine if they have fluid and electrolyte disturbances. We may need to look at the whole picture. Another thing is, what was their baseline of confusion? That's why it's important to have baselines. Can you compare, is their confusion worse now? So then that may say, wait a minute, they're more confused today than they have been in the last several weeks. Is there something else going on? Is this just not their normal confusion from their Alzheimer's? Okay, so that's important to note the differences. So that's why we really have to be keen on our assessment. And then confusion is never normal, common, or expected in the elderly after they've had surgery. They shouldn't have confusion after they have surgery. Now, obviously, we're going to be disoriented when we wake up after anesthesia. But that, remember I said, will go away. So it's not normal for them to stay confused. Okay. So now let's talk about fluid volume excess. We know what a deficit is. So now is what, what is fluid volume excess? That's too much. You got too much fluid. And this is due to fluid overload or diminished homeostatic mechanisms. Remember, we said our body likes to maintain homeostasis. Well, one way that we do that is through fluid regulation. Remember, earlier in the slides we talked about Fluid regulation with our diffusion, osmosis, hormones. So those, home, those things are homeostatic mechanisms to help with the fluid. So if those hormones aren't working right, then the, the patient can develop fluid overload. Now, some risk factors for this are heart failure. If your heart's not pumping effectively, what's going to happen? You're going to have... A lot of fluid. If your kidneys aren't working, what does your kidneys do? Renal failure. Your kidneys make the urine, right? So if your kidneys aren't working, they don't make the urine. They don't eliminate the urine. What's going to happen? You're going to have that fluid overload. If you have cirrhosis of the liver, what goes on with cirrhosis of the liver? The liver is our major organ. It's our, it's our liver's our filter. It helps metabolize. Remember, we said at the beginning that we lose fluid through metabolism. I mean, we get fluid in through metabolism. That's one way that we get fluid in. Well, if our liver's not working or it's not metabolizing correctly, what happens? Remember, we also talked about with liver patients, end-stage liver failure. They develop that third spacing, they develop that swelling, they have a lot of ascites, so they have a lot of volume, they have too much volume. Um, some other um, things with liver is they have malabsorption, malnutrition, and those kind of things can affect your volume. Um, it can affect the way you excrete your, um, your volume. So, some contributing factors here are excessive dietary sodium or sodium containing IV solutions. So, remember the person that takes, drinks a lot of um, carbonated beverages, a lot of sodas. And probably you guys, if you've noticed yourself on a clinical day, if you're just drinking a lot of sodas, if you're not really eating, you're drinking a lot of sodas, even in school, drinking a lot of sodas, if you'll notice, you may have a little bit of edema in your lower extremities. That comes from that excessive amount of sodium. Because what follows salt? Water. Water follows salt. So if you got more sodium, you got more fluid. You got too much fluid. And then also, we have to be mindful, even in the hospital with our patients, of giving them... Um, IV solutions that contain 
a lot of sodium because that can cause them to be in fluid volume excess. And then also, our patients, we need to be monitoring their eyes and nose in the hospital because what if we're giving them all this fluid, but then they're not getting rid of it? So we got to be mindful of how much IV solution we're giving our patients. Now, how does it manifest? We see it in edema. We see that neck vein distension, that JVD, jugular vein distension. Abnormal lung sounds, you'll hear crackles in your lungs, like Rice Krispie treats in your lungs. Tachycardia, why would you have tachycardia? Because you got all this fluid. So guess what your heart has to do now? Work hard. You have an increased blood pressure because you got too much fluid inside, too much pressure inside those vessels. Um, you have an increase in your pulse pressure, your CVP, you got too much uh, CVP, you got too much fluid there. Increase in your weight because you've got edema. Remember um, your core measures when you learned about with your congestive heart failure, one of the things that they need to be doing is weighing themselves daily. And if they gain and weighing themselves at the same time with the same clothing, and if they have an increase in their weight, they need to make sure that they're reporting that to their physician because that could mean that they've got edema, that could mean that they've got fluid volume excess, that could mean that they're going into heart failure. Um, they may have shortness of breath, they may have wheezing. You may see that wheezing with those lungs because what happens? If the heart's pumping, 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 if you're in heart failure and your heart's trying to work hard but it can't work hard because you got too much fluid, where's that fluid going to go? Well, what's connected to your heart? Your lungs. So if it's not going out, it's going back. So if the fluid's going back, it's going back into your lungs because you remember that's the pathway. It goes from the blood, from the lungs to the heart. From the heart, it goes out to the rest of your body. So if it's not going out, it's going back. So you have a lot of issues with your lungs with shortness of breath and crackles and wheezing. And then our medical management, what are we going to do for these patients? Well, we need to fix the cause because if we're not fixing what's going on and we're just fixing the problem, then it's going to happen again. For example, your patient's in heart failure. Their heart's not pumping good. So it's causing them to have too much fluid. They can't get rid of it. Or your kidneys aren't working. Too much fluid, they can't get rid of it. Well, if we give them the medicine to try and get rid of that fluid, to try and diurese them, okay, they may diurese, so we're getting rid of the fluid. But if we don't fix the heart, then guess what? It's going to happen again. If we don't fix the kidneys, then guess what? It's going to happen again. Well, the kidneys, can they be fixed? I know this is something you've not gotten into yet, but when your kidneys go into failure, it's either acute or it's chronic. And if your kidneys are in a chronic renal failure, that's a progressive thing. Usually they do not get better. So what we need to do is, is find an intervention for the kidneys, which is where our dialysis comes into play. We give dialysis to filter. We give dialysis to remove fluid. So now we're fixing the kidney problem so we can fix the other problem. So with fluid volume excess, we got to direct it at what's causing the problem. We need to restrict fluids and sodium. These people don't need sodium. They don't need those IV fluids. They're on a fluid restriction. And as nurses, we got to make sure that we're calculating that fluid restriction. And then we may, may need to administer diuretics to these patients. Uh, can you think of some off the top of your head? What about... Um, well, Lasix for one is for sure uh, ferrosamide, but there are some more potassium sparing diuretics. What about the HCTZ? HCTZ, hydrochlorothiazide. Um, so you want to think about these things. Think about what you're going to be doing and giving your, your patients. So now as a nurse, as a nurse, how do you manage this? <clears throat> well, daily weights. Eyes and nose, remember we talked about that core measure on that with that heart failure patient. We gotta be weighing these patients daily. We need to be measuring those eyes and nose accurately and consistently. When you're going in the room, you need to say, have you had anything to drink? Have you been able to go to the bathroom? Calculate that data, write those numbers down. We need to be assessing lung sounds because remember we said they'll have crackles in their lungs. We need to be checking their extremities for edema. We need to be monitoring their medication is their diuretic working? 
and we need to make sure we're promoting adherence to that fluid restriction. Is it okay for a patient on fluid restriction for you to leave their water pitcher at their bedside? What's that going to do? That's going to tempt them to not be adherent to the fluids restriction. We need to make sure that we're teaching them about sodium. We need to make sure we're teaching them not that to decrease their intake of sodium. They may need to be on a low sodium diet when they're in the hospital. These are things as nurses that we can make sure that we're doing for our patient. The physician may forget to write for a low sodium diet. They may write for a regular diet. But when we've got this issue going on, we want to make sure that they're not getting that much sodium, right? Because that's going to make this problem exacerbate. Also, we're going to need to monitor and avoid sources of excess sodium, including our medications. A lot of times our IV medications, what is it mixed with? Saline. What is saline? Sodium chloride. So we got to be mindful of that. The other thing is promoting rest. Semi-fowler position, because if your patient's got a lot of fluid and it's in their lungs, guess what? They're not going to be able to breathe. They're going to be shortness of breath. So sit them up. Sit them up helps them to breathe there, prevents that orthopenia, that shortness of breath. And we need to make sure that we're doing good skin care, positioning them, turning them, because these patients are going to be very edematous. And when they get to um, a point of the severe edema, what can happen is that fluid can start leaking out of their skin, leaking out of their pores. And that's called weeping. They'll have that fluid just seeping out of their pores. Well, guess what happens? That fluid just stays on their skin. They're at risk for skin breakdown. So we've got to be really, really careful with these patients and skin care and turning them and reposition them. Even the turning and reposition helps to promote movement of that fluid. So fluid and electrolyte is serious business, serious business, um, especially the fluid volume. It, you... Um, it's detrimental if you have too much. It's detrimental if you don't have enough. So we've got to be mindful of this fluid volume um, with our patients. So now let's talk about electrolytes since we have just talked about fluids for a little bit. I want to um, park here a minute with our electrolytes. Now this stuff that I'm fixing to go over, you should already know this. This is a review is what this is. You should have gotten this back in your anatomy and um, physiology classes, your biology classes. But the thing I want you to know is what is an electrolyte? What is it? What do I mean when I say electrolyte? Electrolytes are chemicals that carry an electrical charge, electrolyte. Now we have two different types. They either have a positive charge or they have a negative charge. If our electrolyte has a positive charge, it's called a cation. Some people say cation. If the electrolyte has a negative charge, it's called a anion. So they're either your electrolytes are either positive or negative. Electrolytes are chemicals that have an electric charge. Now, the major cations, cations in our body are sodium, you see there, positive charge, potassium, positive charge, calcium, positive charge, magnesium, positive charge, and hydrogen ions have a positive charge. Now, our major anions, which are our negative charge electrolytes, are chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate, sulfate. You'll see these in the body. The kidneys produce synthesize your bicarbonate. So you'll see these occurring in the body. So when from the next time you go to look at your chemistry, your electrolyte with your patient, look at it and say, that's a, a canine. Or that's an anion. You can just by reading your chemistry, because the with electrolytes, the way to learn these is you're just gonna have to know them. You're gonna have to know these electrolytes. You're gonna have to you know, this is where your memorization is going to come in. You've got to know this stuff. You've got to know the values for your lab or the rest of this stuff's not going to make sense. You, you take the stuff that you memorize and you apply it to your different patient situations. So if you study by note cards, if you study by writing it down, if you study by reciting it, if you study by talking it out with another um, student or another person, whatever your strategy is, you've got to you got to remember these things. You got to, and and my thing is, the more you do it, the more you do it, the more you talk about it, the more you see it, the more you read about it, the more you associate it with your patients, 
the more it'll become ingrained in your mind. And so I challenge you, I challenge you to, to keep these electrolytes in front of you. This affects every patient has electrolytes. So keep this in front of you. Now, um, and, and use your strategies to help you remember. As we're even going through this PowerPoint, use your strategies. If you need to write it down, if you need to put it on a note card, if you need to talk about it with somebody, if you need to stop the PowerPoint and say it out loud, whatever you need to do so you can remember these things. Because I'm going to break down each of these um, electrolytes and we're going to speak to them specific. So you know what... Um, they are, you know, the manifestations if a patient has too low or too high. So now, the concentrations of your electrolytes differ in fluid compartments. For example, intracellular versus extracellular. Remember, you have the two compartments, inside the cell, outside the cell. You have more potassium inside the cell than outside the cell. That's why when you draw your blood, your plasma, your venous stick, and your potassium level is normally, what, 3.5? Inside your cell, your potassium will be over 100. And like your sodium, for example, you have more sodium outside of your cell than you do inside the cell. So when you draw your sodium value and you look at it on your chemistry, your sodium will be 135. But on the inside, it may be 5. You, you see the difference there? So the concentration is different in the different fluid compartments. So I just wanted you to note that because that's going to be important when you start talking about your disease processes, you know, especially when um, we get into like with hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, pulling potassium out of the cells, putting potassium back in the cells with our burn patients. Um, so these, these are all going to come into play um, as you learn more about your disease processes and your reduction of risk potential, your physiologic adaptation. So um, just note that there are different concentrations in the different compartments. So electrolyte imbalances. These are the few right here that I want to talk about for the purpose of this lecture. We're going to talk about sodium first. It's either too low, hyponatremia, remember, or hypernatremia. So sodium, hyponatremia, natremia. Sodium, Na, natremia. Hypernatremia. Potassium is hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia. So remember that. Na, na, natremia. Sodium. K, kalemia, potassium. Your calcium. Hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, C-A-C-A. -C -A. Easy ways for you to remember these so you know what we're talking about. Magnesium, hypomagnesium, hypermagnesium, mag, you see there. Phosphorus, hypophosphatemia, hyperphosphatemia. And then chloride, hypochloremia, hyperchloremia. So these are the imbalances that we're going to be discussing as we continue through with this lecture. If you need to stop and take a break, I'm fine with that. If you need to get a piece of paper so you can take some more notes because I want you to really um, write these things down so you can really get a handle on these electrolytes. Okay, so now let's talk about hyponatremia. I have actually um, added a picture here for um, the visual learners. But hyponatremia, remember we said, is low sodium. With hyponatremia, your sodium is going to be less than 135. Now, it's important to note here that the normal range of sodium is 135 to 145. So anything less than 135 is not enough. The reason that hyponatremia occurs is because of adrenal insufficiency. Remember we talked about your adrenal gland? that's on your, the top of your kidneys. So if um, your adrenal gland is not working right, then we're getting rid of too much sodium. Another thing is water intoxication. Drinking too much water, because what happens when you um, drink too much water is we tend to lose our salt. 
SIADH, that is the syndrome of inappropriate diuretic hormone. And what's happening with that disease process is the patient is voiding, voiding, voiding. They have that, um, their antidiuretic hormone is not working right, and so they're just diuresin, 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 so they're losing their um, sodium. Uh, the other thing is you can lose it by vomiting, by diarrhea, by sweating, and the di diuretics that you take. Now, what you're going to see with these clients with hyponatremia is they're going to have a poor skin turker, dry mucosa. They can have a headache, decreased salivation, because you think dry mucosa, decreased salivation. They also can have a decreased blood pressure, nausea, abdominal cramping, and neurological changes. Some, a lot of times these patients become um, confused. They become really confused when they have hyponatremia. Um, and the other thing that can happen is these patients can actually um, develop seizures. That's why this is so important, um, making sure that we're monitoring this hyponatremia is because our patient is at risk for go, um, developing seizures with a low sodium. Because you think about what do we need for muscle contractions and what excites our muscle contractions? It's our sodium and our potassium and our calcium. So if we don't have um, enough of our sodium, then we might have too much of something else and our patients end up actually developing seizures. The other thing is that they can develop a um, coma. So what we want to do with these patients, if they're hyponatremic, we want to give them salt. That's what they're missing is salt. So we want to make sure that we're restricting water not fluids per se, but water, because the water is actually what's causing them to be the hyponatremic in, in some cases. And then we're going to want to replace that sodium. Uh, a point I want to add in here is that when we're replacing sodium on our patients, let's say, for example, that a patient's sodium is uh, 104. I think that's probably the lowest sodium level that I've ever taken care of in um, my practice with patients. It's been 104. But um, what we do is we need to replace that sodium very slowly. If we try to bring that sodium up too fast, what can actually happen is the patient can develop cerebral edema because of the fluid shift because we're bringing up the sodium too fast and what follows sodium? Water. And so they can actually end up with severe cerebral edema, stroke. So we have to be really, really careful when we're replacing that sodium. Um, typically, um, physicians don't like to see um, sodium levels raise more than one to two points in a 12 hour shift. And I know you say, whoa, if the sodium is 104, then 106 is still really low. Yes, it is really low during your shift, but the point is that it's actually going up. It's getting better. And if it would go from 104 to 135 um, within six hours or less than 12 hours, then your patient could develop that cerebral edema. So we got to really be careful about that because as nurses, if you're taking care of these patients, um, if they have that low sodium level, you'll be the one that's given that replacement. So you have to be really careful and make sure you're monitoring their sodium levels as you um, gradually replace it. And the other thing is we need to assess these patients and we want to um, prevent this from happening again. We want to um, give them dietary sodium, increase their fluid intake. We want to identify and monitor their risk for this patient. Why aren't they getting enough sodium? Are they vomiting? If we don't fix the problem, then we're going to continue to have this um, hyponatremia. And then also we have to look at the effects of our medicines like our um, diuretics and our lithium. In this uh, picture here, it shows you about one particular medicine, mannitol. Now, mannitol is given to patients like with cerebral edema, for example. And what it does is it causes fluid to shift from intracellular to extracellular. And this causes um, dilution and hyponatremia. So in the critical care setting, you may be actually ministering this medication like mannitol. Um, and so we just need to be really careful and monitor our patients for that hyponatremia 
when we are um, taking care of them. And the other thing is gastric suctioning. You see there, anytime you're losing fluids from your body, that is not a normal way to lose them, which is through, remember how we said we um, get rid of fluids? We regulate fluids. We take them in by what? Beverages, food, metabolism, and we lose fluids by urination, um, sweating, our lungs, breathing. We lose fluids that way, our feces. So if we're losing an extensive amount of fluid, then that puts us at risk for developing this hyponatremia. So let's go to the next one. Hypernatremia is opposite. Is a sodium level greater than 145? Remember we said the normal sodium is 135 to 145. So if your sodium is higher than 145, you're considered hypernatremic. Now the reason that this happens is because of excess water loss. Remember, hyponatremia occurred because of too much water. Hypernatremia occurs because you don't have enough water. And then sometimes excess sodium administration in the hospital, we're giving our patients normal saline, normal saline, normal saline. And if we're not careful, um, the patients can develop the hypernatremia because we're giving them um, sodium. And then we got to be careful with diabetes insipidus. Remember we talked about that earlier in some slides when we were talking about fluid regu regulation and fluid volume deficit. With diabetes insipidus, these patients are um, have got an issue with their pituitary gland. And so they cannot regulate their fluid. So they lose fluid, lose fluid, lose fluid. And then what happens is um, they end up hypernatremic. I have seen cases where patient sodium levels with diabetes insipidus have been 170. And that is very, very, very dangerous with these patients because they can go into a coma if their um, sodium level gets up so high. Another place we'll see this is with heat strokes. And then um, we talked about some IV solutions at the very beginning of the lecture, but the hypertonic IV solutions where there's high concentrations of sodium um, can cause our um, sodium level to be elevated. So now what's going to happen in these patients? What are we going to see? They're going to be very thirsty, obviously, because their, their sodium level is high, and, and sodium wants water. They're going to have an elevated temperature. They may have a dry, swollen tongue, sticky mucosa. They'll have some neurological symptoms. They'll be restless. They'll be weak. Remember I said they can actually go into a coma here. And one thing I want you to note is that when you've got elderly patients, their thirst may be impaired. They may not have a sensation for thirst. So we cannot necessarily use thirst um, every time or solely as our um, assessment key factor that tells us the patient's got hypernatremia. We really have to look at the whole person. So what we do for these patients, if your sodium is high, obviously we don't want to give you sodium. But what we need to give you is some water. And so we'll give patients hypotonic solutions like D5W, which is 5% dextrose with water. Because remember we talked about earlier that what will happen if you, get, if you infuse straight water into your patient, your cells will rupture and burst. You'll end up with massive edema and you actually die by having an IV infusion of just simply water. But here, when we give water with a little bit of dextrose, that creates a hypotonic solution. Even though the dextrose is concentrated, the water balances it out and makes it that hypotonic solution. And we um, replace um, the fluid loss with our patient while we're bringing down the um, sodium. In this case, if the patient has fluid loss and stuff, but their sodium is elevated, you wouldn't want to give them um, half normal saline because that's still normal saline. Or you wouldn't want to give them normal saline because of the sodium that's in that. Even though the sodium may be very small, there is still sodium, so we want to make sure that we're restricting that sodium. And then, again, we're going to make sure that we're assessing. We want to assess them um, for over-the-counter sources of sodium. Can you think of some things? that patients may take over the counter that contains sodium. What about um, uh, Dolcasate sodium or um, 
some antacids or um, baking soda. All these different things that your patient um, may take over the counter that actually has sodium. And then think about their salt intake. Do they put a lot of salt on their foods? We want to encourage the um, patient to um, take fluids so that they can replace that water loss. And then we want to provide sufficient water with our patients with two feedings, which is something sometimes that we can neglect because we think about our patients on two feedings, right? So they're not taking anything in except through that tube that's in their nose, in their mouth, or in their um, stomach, whatever's going into their gastrointestinal system. So we're feeding them, feeding them, feeding them. But what we got to realize is these patients also have to have some water to balance out all those tube feedings. And so they're at risk for getting that hypernatremia, so we have to be really, really careful. Um, I added a visual image here for you visual learners that says, so you can um, remember, hyponatremia, you are fried. If you've got hyponatremia, you are fried. You have a fever. You have flushed skin. You have restlessness. You have increased fluid retention and an elevated blood pressure because what? Water follows salt. You have edema because why? Water follows salt. And then you have a decreased urinary output and dry mouth. So that's just for you visual learners so you can kind of remember about hypernatremia. But when you have hypernatremia, you are fried. So now let's talk about hypokalemia. Your potassium level is normally, and this varies from institution, some people say 3.5 to 5, some people say 3.5 to 5.3, some people say 3.5 to 5.5. Um, whenever you're taking a test or questions about sodium level, it'll be out of the normal range. Like it won't be a 3.53, and then you're trying to decide is that normal, is that abnormal. It'll be like a 5.9, a 5.7, a 6.0, or a 3.3 or 3.2, so you know the difference with your um, potassium levels. So if your potassium is below 3.5, then that is considered hypokalemia, not enough potassium. Now this occurs um, with alkalosis due to a shift in the serum potassium, which remember we talked about alkalosis before um, with our um, ABGs and acid-base balance. So um, normally potassium levels with alkalosis can shift into the cells. Now the reason that this occurs, the reason hypokalemia occurs, is because there's a GI loss. Their medications can cause hypokalemia to occur, like your diuretics, for example. Lasix is one that comes to mind. Um, it is not a potassium sparing diuretic, so when the patient is voiding, they're actually losing um, potassium as well. And then alterations in your acid base. Remember we talked about just a minute ago, alkalosis. And then if you have hyperaldosteronism, remember, aldosterone, you think about our hormones. And then our poor dietary intake. Maybe they're just not taking in enough potassium. Maybe they're losing a lot and they're not um, eating the um, correct foods to replace that potassium. So what are we going to see with these patients is a lot of fatigue, anorexia, they'll have nausea, vomiting, dysrhythmias. Dysrhythmias is when um, your cardiac rhythm, the electrical conduction in your heart is um, abnormal. And the reason that is is because potassium and sodium, remember we talked about muscle contractions. So if you don't have enough of potassium, that can really inhibit those contractions tractions. So you end up with some dysrhythmias, muscle weakness, cramps. Remember again, we said that potassium helps in muscle contraction. Um, paresthesis, uh, glucose intolerance, decreased muscle strength, deep, um, decreased deep tendon um, reflexes. And uh, how we're going to treat that is by giving them potassium. They need potassium replacements. Um, and if your patient has a severe deficit in their potassium, a lot of times we'll administer IV potassium. But the thing to note here is IV potassium cannot be given fast. Remember, just like how we said sodium, you cannot replace somebody's sodium fast. Well, IV potassium cannot be given fast. 
it is infused, typically you give 10 milliequivalents over one hour. And, and you gotta have a good IV to administer that medication. In the critical care setting, if you've got a, a big IV like a central line, which you guys have learned about, sometimes the doctors, depending on how low the potassium is, will allow the nurse to administer 20 milliequivalents in one hour. But the safest is to administer 10 milliequivalents over an hour. Now, I will just, um, just add a little um, funny in here. Um, well, I guess it's really not funny, but the only time that I've ever seen IV potassium administered very fast, and when I say very fast, I mean within 15 minutes, is at the correctional institutions for patients that are um, on death row receiving the, um, the death penalty. And during their last um, few moments, they're actually given IV potassium over 15 minutes. Now, this is very painful because it, it, it stops your heart. So at the same time, they're also given some, some sedatives so it's um, ethical, but um, for lack of better terms. But anyways, with the IV potassium, just remember, it's got to be given slow. And as a nurse, we're going to be assessing it. We're going to be assessing their hyperkalemia. We're going because it is life threatening. You can die from hyperkalemia. We're going to be monitoring their EKG, monitoring their ABGs because why? It can cause dysrhythmias. It can cause um, it can be caused by acid base imbalance. So we want to make sure we're correcting the problem. We're going to monitor um, their dietary potassium. We want to make sure that they're getting potassium, but we don't want to get them to get too much and then develop the hyperkalemia. And then we're going to want to be really careful related to that IV potassium administration, which we just talked about. Another point that I want to add in here while we're on the topic of hypokalemia is potassium is actually absorbed better in the stomach. And I know for severe um, deficit, they'll give IV um, potassium because it's very quick. But it's more beneficial to the patient if they can actually get it in their stomach. It's actually absorbed better. With the IV potassium, you have to keep replacing it. Give them more IV, then more IV, then more IV. But if you give it to them in the stomach, that seems to sustain them. So a lot of physicians will actually prefer to give potassium supplements via um, the GI tract, like a pill. They'll ingest it via pill um, or the liquid potassium. So just some things to consider. Um, with this hypokalemia, this is very serious and this can be very life-threatening. And then I've added this um, funny over here, the visual image for you guys to, um, for you visual learners, and it's called a sick Walt, because this guy's name is Walt. And a sick Walt is how we remember um, hypokalemia. It's caused by alkalosis. It causes shallow respirations, irritability, confusion, drowsiness, weakness, fatigue, arrhythmias. You'll have an irregular heart rate. You'll have tachycardia with hypokalemia. You'll be lethargic, thready pulse, and then you also have a in decrease in your intestinal mobility, which can lead to nausea, vomiting, and or an ileus. So you see there, poor Walt, he looks pitiful, doesn't he? Now, so now let's talk about hyperkalemia, that we know what hypokalemia is. With hyperkalemia, your potassium here is five, greater than 5.0. Now remember I said that number varies a little bit based on institutions. Some institutions may say if it's greater than 5.3. It really is just going to depend on where you work. Um, but when we start getting up there in the fives with our potassium level, it's starting to get serious. And we do not want to get um, hyperkalemic because that's very dangerous too. Now the reason this occurs usually is because... Um, of treatment that we're giving our patient. Uh, impaired renal function, so our, our kidneys don't excrete that um, potassium out. And then the hypoaldosteronism, again, that's our hormone. Uh, tissue trauma, and then acidosis. We you see this sometimes even with burn patients because what happens is potassium is found more inside of our cells, right? So whenever, so it's on the inside, it's, it's intracellular instead of extracellular. Well, when we draw our blood, we're drawing it in the extracellular intravascular spaces, right? So it's in our vein. So what happens is when we have tissue trauma, 
our body our body's defense mechanism um, kicks in and we want to start trying to repair our cell but well one thing that starts happening is potassium starts leaving the cell and going in the extracellular spaces so when you have that tissue trauma or burns it leaves the cell, goes into the extracellular spaces, and in the extracellular spaces, that's where you'll see your elevated potassium level of the um, greater than the 5.0. Now, what can happen when this happens and you got the hyperkalemia is patients will start having cardiac changes. They'll have dysrhythmias, muscle weakness, again, because you, we are talking about potassium is needed for contraction. Um, they could have respiratory impairment, paresthesis, anxiety, and GI manifestations with the abdominal cramping and the diarrhea. The diarrhea. Now, how we're going to treat this, our medical management with hyperkalemia, is we're going to want to make sure that we're monitoring that EKG. Now, why do we want to really be careful about that? Well, one, this patient can actually have a heart attack. So if we're not careful in monitoring that EKG, we could miss key assessment pieces that would clue us in that the patient is at risk for having a heart attack. We need to make sure that we're limiting their dietary potassium. There are certain medications that we can give. k is one of those medications. And what happens with k is the patient ingests it. It's a, it's a medicine that you give orally. And then it goes into the intestines. Well, it's a potassium binds to k -exalate. So what happens is the, all the potassium that's in your intervascular spaces says, oh, let me go there. And it, it goes straight to your intestines where that k is. And then what ha our body does is it excretes out the potassium through our feces. So a lot of times if our kidneys aren't working and our kidneys can't get rid of the potassium, um, especially in renal patients, they'll be given k so it, they can get rid of it in their GI system since they can't get rid of it in their urinary system. The other thing we give is um, sodium bicarbonate because remember we talked about potassium and sodium have an opposing relationship. We can give IV calcium gluconate, insulin, and a hypertonic uh, dextrose. And this is like a cocktail that we give patients when they're hyperkalemic. And the purpose of it is, is the, um, the insulin and the calcium, they go into the cell and they cause the potassium, um, they go into this, your blood system and they cause the potassium to go back into the cells, right? So it causes the potassium to go back into the cells and get out of that extracellular space. So you'll see patients in the hospital, especially if they've got a potassium, let me think, probably 8.5 8.6 is the highest that I that I have taken care of a client so we need to get that down pretty quickly right or this patient is going to go into cardiac arrest and so what the doctor has ordered as a quick fix is that insulin um, the hypertonic dextrose which is usually D50 you'll see that a lot so the insulin D50 and then the calcium gluconate and the calcium gluconate and the insulin are what really um, helps promote that um, potassium to go back into the cells and then the dextrose just kind of helps balances everything out and plus you need some dextrose because you've just now given your patient some insulin so those three things that's like a nice cocktail that you'll see given in the hospital with to help manage hyperkalemia but now it's a quick fix it doesn't sustain that potassium can leave right the cells right again especially if there's a tissue trauma or if there's acidosis. So we want to make sure that we're correcting the underlying problem with this um, potassium issue or that we're giving them something more long-term that can sustain them. Uh, beta-2 agonist is something else. And then dialysis is a nice fix because dialysis, what it does is it is a filter. It um, takes the place of your kidneys. Your kidney's job is to filter, to get rid of those electrolytes that you don't need and to keep the ones that you do need. So with dialysis, it's kind of the same process. It is our filter, and if you've got too much potassium, when you um, have a patient, for example, that's in renal failure, we want them to go to dialysis. They need to go to dialysis so they can get their um, system filtered and get that potassium removed. And then I've included another picture here for you guys, um, for you visual learners that just talks about hyperkalemia. It causes muscle twitching, cramps, paresthesis, irritability, anxiety. It decreases your blood pressure. 
you have EKG changes, dysrhythmias, abdominal cramping, and um, diarrhea. So you see here, this fellow looks pitiful. But hyperkalemia is very serious, and it is dangerous. Patients can die from this. They, excuse me, patients will die from this if it is not corrected. Now, this is just a little bit more about hyperkalemia because I wanted to. I found this label that I wanted to point out to you and add um, a note here. With our nursing management, we got to be assessed and we got to make sure that we're mixing our IVs that can contain potassium very well. We don't want to give them too much too fast. Monitor our medications, our dietary potassium restrictions. What happens is patients, they can't have salt. They've got on a sodium restriction, so they'll take salt substitutes. Well, the salt substitutes may contain a lot of potassium. Here I put a label for a particular salt substitute there, and I've highlighted the potassium. You see there is 10 milligrams of potassium. And you'll find that with um, a lot of the salt substitutes. So what we try to encourage our patients to do is stay away from those salt substitutes because it can be very detrimental. On one hand, while they are keeping their sodium down, they could be creating another problem that's even more dangerous. So, and then um, want to make sure that we're really drawing our blood above any site that we're infusing any medicine. Now, this is something that happens in the hospital is we'll be giving patient PPN, TPN, or they may be getting uh, D5 half normal saline with 20th K. That's standard on the surgical floor. You'll see that a lot because they're trying to make sure they don't lose um, potassium after they've had surgery. Well, what happens is the IV may be in the AC and the lab will come and draw the blood at the wrist or the hand or the forearm. And so um, they'll have a false lab result because of they're drawn in that same arm where the IV potassium is infusing. So it may not actually be accurate and we may be treating something that's not even there. They just got a bad sample of their blood. So we want to really make sure that when you're drawing blood, you draw it above the site. So you're not having any um, false results. Or I would even say go to the whole um, another extremity and draw that blood. And so we got to be really careful there. And then potassium sparing diuretics may cause elevation in potassium. The thing is, um, patients are avoided, 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 but our potassium is being saved. So our potassium levels can increase, so we have to be careful. We, there's a fine line when you're talking about diuretics between potassium sparing and potassium wasting. We don't want to lose um, too much, but we don't want to save too much either. And with this potassium sparing diuretics, I put a note here, this should never be used in renal patients with renal dysfunction because these patients can't get rid of potassium to start with. So now we're going to give them something that makes them hold on to potassium so they don't excrete it. So we would not want to give potassium sparing diuretics to patients with renal dysfunction because remember, renal dysfunction is a risk factor for developing hyperkalemia. Continue with hypocalcemia. Um, with hypocalcemia, your calcium level is less than 8.5. Now, the serum calcium level must also be considered in conjunction with your serum albumin. So you'll see your serum albumin level um, below as well. The reason that this occurs is because of hypoparathyroidism. Let me say that one more time hypoparathyroidism malabsorption so you're not getting that nutrition that you need again remember we talked about that the that protein level that albumin level is going to be low pancreatitis pancreatitis can lead to that malabsorption alkalosis massive transfusion of um, blood now we see this a lot in patients that actually have had traumas when you have to get unit of blood after unit of blood after unit of blood. Um, and one thing that um, physicians usually do is they replace the calcium after so many units of blood. They're continually monitoring that calcium level. But with massive um, transfusions, patients tend to become hypocalcemic. 
and then renal failure, and then medications can cause this to occur. Now, what will we see in our patients? Hypocalcemia is pretty interesting. Um, you'll see tetany. Now, what's tetany, you're asking? Tetany is that muscle twitching, muscle twitching. And then you'll see um, circumoral numbness. When I say circumoral numbness, I'm talking about the numbness around your lips. You know, like, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this or not, but when um, patients go on binges drinking, or maybe they just go out and have fun at um, one night, and they consume a little bit too much alcohol, sometimes they'll get that numbness around their lips after they um, are pretty happy. And that same sensation is, is what you'll see with patients with hypocalcemia. That's what we're talking about when we say that circumoral numbness. And then paresthesis, hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. Again, we talk about muscle twitching. They'll have that tetany. Trousseaux and checkoffs are two signs that we actually use to assess a patient to see if they're hypokalemic. Now, I've um, included on the next slide um, for you guys, actually probably the next um, two slides from now, pictures of actually, so you get an idea in your mind of what trousseau sign is and what checkoff sign is. So you're going to actually get to see a visual image of that, So you, but know that those are two tests that's done to test for hypocalcemia. Patients may have seizures with this because what does calcium assist with? Muscular contractions. They may have respiratory symptoms of um, dyspnea, laryngeal spasms, abnormal clotting, and then anxiety. So I put a picture here for you, the cats of hypocalcemia. So cats, C-A-T-S, convulsions, arrhythmias, because arrhythmia is muscle contraction, convulsion, muscle contraction, tetany muscle twitching, and then spasms and strider. And the strider actually comes from that laryngospasm. So that's a um, couple things about hypocalcemia. So now what are we going to do to treat these patients with hypocalcemia? We give them IV calcium gluconate, calcium and vitamin D supplements and their diet. But I highlighted this calcium gluconate here because there's um, a couple of different kinds of IV calcium. But for a hypocalcemia, IV calcium gluconate is what we're actually going to be giving um, these patients. And then we want to make sure that we're giving them vitamin D because vitamin D helps us to what? Absorb our calcium. And then we want to encourage them to eat a diet that has a lot of calcium in it. Now with our nursing management, we want to assess this because severe hypocalcemia is life-threatening. Now why do you think it's life-threatening? Because remember we talked about muscle contraction. It affects muscle contraction. So if you've got that seizure, you can go into a coma. If you have arrhythmias, you can have a heart attack. So hypocalcemia is life-threatening. We want to encourage our patients to do weight-bearing exercises to decrease the bone loss of calcium. We want to teach them about their diet, their medications, and then um, we want to make um, special care when we're administering that IV calcium. Remember I said calcium gluconate is what we administer our patients. And that's infused very slowly. That's not something that we... Um, give pretty fast when we're trying to replace that calcium. It comes in an IV piggyback, so we'll give that calcium gluconate. And these are these are the pictures that I was telling you about with the trousseau sign and the checkoff sign. What we're actually checking for here is for tetany. A clinical manifestation of hypocalcemia is tetany. So what you do is with the trousseau sign, you put a blood pressure cuff on the patient's arm and you blow the blood pressure cuff up. When you blow the blood pressure cuff up, the patient will have a twitching in their wrist. And you see it'll, it'll look something like what's in the picture. 
that muscle twitching in their wrist when the blood pressure cuff is blown up is a sign that a patient is hypocalcemic. This is called Trousseau sign. Because typically when you're in clinical and you put a blood pressure cuff on your patient and you blow it up to check the patient's blood pressure, you inflate your cuff, does the patient's wrist typically um, twitch and contract? No, it does not. So if you're in clinical, you're checking a blood pressure, you inflate your cuff, and then your patient's wrist starts twitching, then you think, ooh, hypocalcemia. So that's trousseau sign with checkoff sign. That's another um, test for hypocalcemia. And what you're looking for here is tetany, muscle twitching. So what they'll do is they'll tap on the facial nerve and when they tap on the face, at the cheek, at the cheek you'll tap, the, the patients will have twitching in their cheek and their eye. So you'll see here in this picture, you see that gentleman um, there twitching, squinting his eye, his cheek, you see that contraction there? That's uh, called checkoff sign. And that's something that you can um, test your patient for, especially if you think that they're hypocalcemic. You want to make sure that you're, you're using um, your assessment tools. And these are two assessment tools um, as nurses that we can use. Now here's a question for you. You're a nurse caring for a 65-year-old female patient who is in renal failure. And remember, renal failure can cause you to have all kinds of abnormalities in your electrolytes. Well, during your shift assessment, the patient complains of tingling in her lips and fingers. Whenever anyone takes her blood pressure, remember we talked about tingling in the lips? She tells you that she gets a spasm in her wrist and hand and that it's very painful. So what do you suspect? And this should be an obvious answer here. Hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hypermagnesium, or hyperkalemia. And the answer is B, hypocalcemia. Tetany is the most characteristic manifestation of hypocalcemia and hypomagnesium. Sensation of tingling may occur in the tips of the fingers, around the mouth, and less commonly in the feet. Taking a normal blood pressure could elicit a carpal spasm if it creates slight ischemia of the ulnar nerve. Option A is incorrect. Hypophosphatemia creates central nerve dysfunction, resulting in seizure and coma. Option C is incorrect. Hypermagnesium creates hypoactive reflexes, and tetany is a hyperactive. And then option D is incorrect because hyperkalemia creates paresthesis and anxiety. So here's another question for you. The nurse is assessing the patient for the presence of a checkoff sign. What electrolyte imbalance does a positive checkoff sign indicate? Hypermagnesium, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia. And the answer is C. You can induce checkoff sign by tapping the patient's facial nerve adjacent to the ear. Remember we talked about on the cheek. A brief contraction in the upper lip, nose, and or side of the face indicates checkoff sign. Both hypomagnesium and hypocalcemia may be tested using checkoff sign. So now hypercalcemia. You got too much calcium. With this, your calcium level is greater than 10.5. Now, some things that cause this is malignancy, cancers. Cancers can cause this. Hyperparathyroidism. Bone loss related to immobility. And what we're going to see in our patients is muscle weakness. They're not going to be coordinated, anorexic, constipated, nauseated, vomiting, abdominal and bone pain, polyuria, thirst, EKG, 
changes and dysrhythmias. And the dysrhythmias would be the EKG changes. But so what's happening is your patients are laying in the bed. And if they're laying in the bed, they look, they can have bone loss, right? So what happens is the calcium leaves the bone and it enters our bloodstream, our blood system, intravascular spaces. And that's where we see that bone pain because you've got bone loss. And uh, when we have too much calcium in our intervascular system, we'll have that weakness, not able to be coordinated because of that bone loss, polyuria, thirst. We'll see all these things happening. So the way we want to treat this is to fix what's going on. Is it immobility? Can we get the patient up out of the bed? Can we promote mobility for our patient? Is it a cancer? Is it something that we can treat there? Um, is it a problem with their parathyroid? Uh, we want to give them fluids, furosemide, phosphates, calcitonin, biophosphates. All of these things can be given to patients with hypercalcemia to bring that calcium level down. Now, as nurses, we need to be mindful <clears throat> If they have a hypercalcemic crisis, which when they have that hyperparathyroidism, if their calcium level gets too high, they are at risk for death. There's a high mortality rate. We want to encourage our patient to emulate. They need fluids of three to four liters a day. We want to be providing fluids that contains sodium unless it's contraindicated, unless it is that renal patient or unless they have that hypernatremia. We want to give them fiber for constipation and we want to make sure that they're safe. We want to make sure that we're promoting safety because what did we say? They have muscle weakness. They're not coordinated. They have bone pain. So if they get up and try to ambulate, they may be at risk for falling. So some things to consider with hypercalcemia. Here's a question for you. You're caring for a patient on the oncology floor with a diagnosis of metastatic brain cancer. During your assessment, you note the patient complains of abdominal pain. Skin turgor indicates dehydration is present. What would you further assess for in this patient? So, they've got cancer. The patient's having abdominal pain they're dehydrated. So what are you going to look for? Hypernatremia, hypomagnesium, hypophosphatemia, or hypercalcemia. The most common cause of hypercalcemia are malignancies. Remember we talked about those cancers and the hyperparathyroidism. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and constipation are common symptoms with hypercalcemia. Remember we talked about that. Dehydration occurs with nausea and vomiting, anorexia, and calcium reabsorption at the proximal renal tube. So that's where the calcium is reabsorbed. Abdominal and bone pain may also be present. Option A is incorrect because primary manifestations of hypernatremia are neurologic and would not include abdominal pain and dehydration. Option B is incorrect because tetany is the most common characteristic manifestation of hypomagnesium and hypocalcemia. And this scenario did not mention tetany. Option C is incorrect because most of the signs and symptoms of phosphorus deficits appear to result from a deficit of ATP. Remember, ATP picks up a phosphorus and ADP is formed. That's your energy. That's your intercellular energy. Um, and so when you have that, you'll have neurologic symptoms too. But with hypercalcemia. You see you there, you'll have those abdominal pain. You'll have that weakness. You'll have that nausea and vomit. You'll have that dehydration. 
So you see the differences there. Because remember I said you can learn from not getting the answer right. Or even if you did get the answer right, you still need to read the rationale because you can learn from the rationale. So now let's talk about hypomagnesium. What is hypomagnesium? Hypomagnesium is magnesium level less than 1.8. This is also evaluated along with your serum albumin, which is your protein. The reason hypomagnesium occurs is because of alcoholism, which we see common with hypomagnesium. GI losses, internal or parental feedings, deficient in magnesium um, medicines, so there's some kind of deficit there. Rapid administration of blood. Remember we talked about rapid administration of blood with our other electrolyte. Contributing causes include diabetic ketoacidosis, sepsis, burns, and hypothermia. A lot of times when you see your patient that has a low magnesium level, they'll have a low potassium level too. So some things we're going to look for are neuromuscular irritability, weakness, tremors, EKG changes, and alteration in mood. We're going to want to make sure that they're getting a good diet, they're getting oral magnesium, or we can give them magnesium sulfate IV. I've included a picture over here for you visual learners about magnesium that you can see here about the causes. There is a reduced intake impaired absorption or increased secretions, excretions with alcoholism, laxative abuse, that's another thing. Um, uh, treatment uh, with diuretics, diuretics can cause them to lose hypomagnesium. Um, and so remember we talked about hypomagnesium, the neuromuscular irritability, the tetany, the muscle weakness, the tremors, so we would use our same signs there, the checkoff sign and the trousseau sign to check and see if our patient has that hypomagnesium. We have to be really careful with this because if they're having neuromuscular irritability, muscle weak, if they're having tremors and stuff, these patients can develop seizures. So we have to be really careful that we're monitoring that neuromuscular irritability, that tetany, that tremor because we do not want these patients to develop a seizure because they can actually go into a coma as a result of the seizure, as a result of hypomagnesium. So here's some other things, hypomagnesium. What are we gonna do about it? We wanna make sure that we're ensuring safety. We need to teach our patients. Why do we wanna make sure we're ensuring safety? These patients could be having tremors. Are they a good candidate for ambulation? Not necessarily. We got to be careful when we ambulate them. We need to be there helping them. They don't need to be ambulating by themselves. We need to teach them about diet, medication, alcohol use. We need to be educating them about that. And we need to um, be careful when we're administering that IV magnesium. Just like our potassium is administered slowly, our IV magnesium is administered slowly. Usually we give a gram over an hour. Um, and then I put here that um, hypomagnesium often is accompanied by hypocalcemia because they have that malabsorption. They can't absorb it. And we need to monitor and treat potential hypocalcemia too. Now, other things that can happen is dysphagia. Dysphagia is common in magnesium depleted patients. And what happens is we need to be assessing their ability to swallow water before we administer foods and medications because they may become dysphagic as a result of this hypomagnesium. So I put another picture here for you visual learners. Um, and this is the uh, hypomagnesium 7. This is some different things that can cause uh, magnesium and things that result from magnesium. There you see malnutrition. Our puny little fellow there, malabsorption, his GI tract's not really working, metabolic acidosis there, uh, related and related to dialysis and renal failure. You see he's got his kidneys there, alcoholism, um, loop diuretics, T 
tetany, the twitch in there, and then the irritable contraction and tremors there. So watch for confusion, depression, irritability, and nystigmas. What that is, is that's your eyes rolling. That's your, like, your, your doll's eyes, your eyes rolling and twitching. So we want to be careful to look for that too. Now, hypermagnesium. So we know what hypomagnesium is. What is hypermagnesium? You've got too much magnesium. So if you don't have enough, your muscles twitch. If you've got too much magnesium, guess what happens? Your muscles become depressed. You lose contraction in your muscles. So, hypermagnesium, your magnesium is greater than 3. It's caused by renal failure, diabetic ketoacidosis, or excessive administration of magnesium. And where you actually may see this excessive administration of magnesium is on, like, the labor and delivery units. Because sometimes when women are in preterm labor, they're having contractions. So, what we want to do is to slow those contractions down. So we give them some magnesium IV. Well, while we're giving them that IV magnesium, we have to be monitoring them the whole time because if they get too much IV magnesium, they can become, develop hypermagnesium. And, um, and then they're at risk for, you see their respiratory depression, uh, nausea, vomiting, hypoactive reflexes, they can enter, enter into a coma even, these patients. Dysrhythmias. So wh while a patient is getting um, IV, the administration of IV magnesium, the nurse is assessing their deep tendon reflexes like every hour, making sure that they're still having those deep tendon reflexes. Because when those reflexes start becoming hypoactive, the nurse knows that the patient's probably getting too much magnesium at that point. Now, what do we do to treat this? Well, our antidote is calcium gluconate. That'll help reverse that hypermagnesium. Loop diuretics so we can get rid of it in our urine. And then um, normal saline. We've got to give them some IV solutions because they got to flush that out of their system. Hemodialysis is also another treatment, especially if it's related to um, renal failure. Hemodialysis will help filter out that magnesium. As nurses, we need to assess. We do not need to administer any medications that contain magnesium because you think like milk of magnesium. Do we give that to our patients when they have constipation? And we need to make sure that we're teaching them about magnesium containing products. Because what if it is somebody that takes milk of magnesium every day over the counter? They're at risk for this hypermagnesium. And then I put another little picture here for you guys that are, are visual learners. Um, Hypermagnesium is rare, but it's usually caused by renal failure or excessive intake of magnesium, which could be in the antacids, or it could be, like I said, the IV magnesium on the labor and delivery floor. You see your kidneys there being effective. And it says, yikes, I have depressed nerve function and skeletal muscle contraction. The person is very weak. They're very weak. They can't move. And, and that weakness starts to depress those muscles in their chest, too, so they become respiratory depressed, the patients can stop breathing with hypermagnesium. So we got to be really, really, really careful with these patients. So here's a question for you. You are caring for a patient with a secondary diagnosis of hypermagnesium. What would you assess this patient for? Would you assess them for hypertension, Cushmall respirations, increased deep tendon reflexes, or shallow respirations? So think about it. What are you going to assess these patients for? What do you expect to see in these patients with hypermagnesium? We're going to be assessing their respiratory status. Answer D. Patients at risk for hypermagnesium are identified and assessed. If hypermagnesium is suspected, <clears throat> the nurse monitors the vital signs, noting hypotension. Hypotension is common with hypermagnesium and shallow respirations. The nurse also observes for a decrease in your deep tendon reflexes. Remember, they don't have the muscle excitability like, like the 
hypomagnesium. With hypermagnesium, it decreases. There's a change in the level of consciousness. Remember I said these patients can become comatose. Option A is incorrect. You would not monitor a patient with hypermagnesium for hypertension because they're at risk for hypotension. Option B is incorrect. Cushmall breathing is a deep and labored breathing pattern associated with severe metabolic acidosis, particularly diabetic ketoacidosis. That's associated with diabetes and acidosis. But it's also associated with renal failure. And the option C is correct. This type of patient is associated with a decreased deep tendon reflux, not an increased deep tendon reflux. So I encourage you to keep going back, reading over these rationales, because you can always learn from these. Here's another question for you. You're caring for a patient admitted with a diagnosis of renal failure. When you review your patient's laboratory reports, you note that the patient's magnesium levels are high. What would be important for you to assess? Diminished deep tendon reflexes, tachycardia, cool clammy skin, increased serum magnesium. So think about it. You want to assess their deep tendon reflexes. To gauge a patient's magnesium status, the nurse should check deep tendon reflexes. If the reflex is absent, that may indicate high serum magnesium. Tachycardia and cool clammy skin are not assessments for hypermagnesium. Option D is incorrect because I was thinking that some of you would choose this. But option D is incorrect because you do not assess increased serum magnesium to assess high magnesium levels. As when you're assessing, when you're assessing, you're looking at at the patient. You're looking at what's going on and you check those deep tendon reflexes. Now, hypophosphatemia. This is when your serum level is low, hypo, your phosphorus is below 2.5. Now the reason this can occur is because of alcoholism, refeeding syndrome, um, <clears throat> Or refeeding someone after they've um, been on starvation. Like, let's say they have been homeless and they haven't had anything to eat for several days. And now we start feeding them all of a sudden. Well, what can happen is a major shift of electrolytes and they can get hypophosphatemia. The other place that you'll see this is in the hospital setting on, like, the surgical floors. When you've had the patients that have had GI surgeries and they've gotten... Um, TPN, so maybe they've been on TPN for several weeks, and now we're going to try and start feeding them food. Well, um, they end up with that refeeding syndrome is what it's called, and it can cause a major disturbance in their, in their electrolytes, and phosphorus is one of those electrolytes. So whenever we're introducing food to patients after they've not had it for a significant period of time, we want to make sure that we're introducing it very slowly. You don't want to dump a lot of food into their GI system um, if they've not had any food in their GI system in a long time because you can create that massive shift of electrolytes and um, that phosphorus level will be decreased. You also see this in heat stroke, um, respiratory alkalosis, hyperventilation, diabetic ketoacidosis, hepatic encephalopathy, major burns. You're losing fluid here. Major burns. You're not absorbing good. Hyperparathyroidism with low magnesium, low potassium, diarrhea, vitamin D deficiency, and the use of diuretics and antacids. Where we'll, um, what we'll see with these patients with hypophosphatemia is confusion, muscle weakness, tissue hypoxia which is dangerous. Muscle and bone pain and they're at an increased susceptibility to infection. So we've really, really got to be careful with these patients because what if it was a burn patient that developed hypophosphatemia? Because their skin is compromised, they're already at risk for infection, right? But now because they have hypophosphatemia, they're at double risk for um, infection. So we really have to be careful. What we're going to do with these patients is give them um, oral or IV phosphorus replacements. 
I'm sure you've seen that. A lot of times um, we'll give it in conjunction with another electrolyte. You may see KFOS given to your um, patients, which is potassium and phosphorus supplement. And as nurses, we want to assess. We want to encourage food time phosphorus. And like I said, we want to gradually introduce calories for the malnourished patients, especially those receiving parental nutrition. We got to be really, really careful um, because we don't want to create that refeeding syndrome for our patients. So here's a question for you. You're caring for a patient with a diagnosis of pancreatitis. The patient was admitted from a homeless shelter and is a poor historian. The patient appears malnourished and TPN has been started. What would you know to start the, why would you know to start the TPN slowly? A, patients receiving TPN are at risk for hypercalcemia if calories are started too rapidly. B, malnourished patients receiving parental nutrition are at a risk for hypophosphatemia if calories are started aggressively. C, malnourished patients who receive fluids too rapidly are at risk for hypernatremia. Or D, patients receiving TPN are at risk for hyperchloremia if fluids are introduced too rapidly. And the answer there is B, we just talked about that. The nurse identifies patients who are at risk for hypophosphatemia and, phosphatemia and monitors them. Because malnourished patients receiving parental nutrition are at risk when calories are introduced too aggressively, preventative measures involving gradual introduction of solutions to avoid rapid shifts of the phosphorus into the cells are important. We've got to do that. Option A, C, and D are incorrect. Patients receiving TPN are not at risk for hypercalcemia, hypernatremia, or hypochloremia if calories or fluids are started too rapidly. So the main thing to take away with hypophosphatemia is that refeeding syndrome. We've got to be real careful because you will see this out in the clinical setting on the med surge floors, on the critical care units. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Hypophosphatemia, malnutrition, we can't give them food too fast. Now, hyperphosphatemia, that's when your serum level is above 4.5. The reason this occurs is because of renal failure. Most often we see this in renal failure. There's an excessive phosphorus, excessive vitamin D, acidosis, hypoparathyroidism, or in chemotherapy, we can also see this. A lot of times there's not many symptoms associated with this. Um, the symptoms usually occur due to the hypocalcemia because it, it accompanies um, hypocalcemia. And what we want to do is to treat underlying disorder what's causing it. Is it the kidneys the problem? Are they getting too much phosphorus? Is it um, acidosis is the problem? So we want to figure out what's causing it and then treat the problem. And then we want to make sure that we're giving them calcium binding um, and acids and phosphate binding gels like uh, Renagel. Have any of you given that on the floor to your patients that may be having in um, renal failure? A lot of times um, patients with kidney disease are on some kind of phosphate binder because of that um, their kidneys aren't functioning well so they are not getting rid of that phosphorus in. and so we have to be really careful with those patients. Dialysis is another way that we can um, filter our system to get rid of all that phosphorus. As nurses we're going to want to avoid high phosphorus foods. We're going to teach our patient avoiding the high phosphorus foods and I put some foods here because remember we talked about they have excess vitamin D so the milks the cheeses the yogurts we got to be really careful with um, the ice creams really careful with those foods with our especially with our renal patients and patients on the chemotherapy and patients that we're concerned about having an elevated phosphorus level and then we also want to make sure that we're monitoring signs of hypocalcemia. So again, we got a big job as nurses related to fluid and electrolyte imbalances because um, these things can be very serious, can be very serious. Now, hypochloremia. With hypochloremia, 
your level will be less than 96. This is caused by Addison's disease. There is a reduce um, in your chloride or reduce in your chloride intake, a GI loss, diabetic ketoacidosis, sweating, fever, burns, medication, and so forth. A loss of chloride occurs with loss of other electrolytes such as sodium and potassium. And typically you see it with uh, sodium. Chloride loves sodium. So if your sodium goes down, your chloride usually goes down. I put a little picture here for you guys to see. It says, um, anytime I drop my level because of diuretics or dietary restrictions, you stick with me and drop to, says sodium. And the chloride says, if you go down, then I'm going down with you. Something is forcing me to be with you. I, it could be metabolic alkalosis from vomiting and loss of hydrochloride. So sodium and potassium, they tend to go together. And the other thing is cystic fibrosis also causes a loss of chloride. There are no specific symptoms with um, hyperchloremia, but you'll see um, stuff that looks like hyponatremia because they're always close together. So you'll see that agitation, weakness, um, the hyperexcitability of their muscles, dysrhythmia, seizures. Remember we said when you have a low sodium, you're at risk for having seizures. So you'll see this kind of stuff with this um, hypochloremia. And then also the way that we can fix this is to replace the chloride. We either give them sodium chloride or half normal saline, which is half sodium chloride. So we want to give them some more because they need sodium and they need chloride most of the time. So we want to really replace both of those because if we're just replacing the chloride and we're not looking at the sodium, then what's going to happen? That chloride's going to go right back down again. And what we're going to do is we want to um, avoid free water, encourage, encourage high chloride foods, and then we want to teach them about a high chloride um, food diet as nurses. A lot of teaching with these patients. So hyperchloremia. Remember we said sodium and chloride, they like to go together. So um, again, if your sodium level is high, you'll probably see your chloride level being high. Um, and then we got to be careful with our um, popcorn, bread, and high salt foods. Got to be really careful with that because remember we said you could develop the hypernatremia where you probably have the hypernatremia with it. So with hyperchloremia, your sodium level is above 108. It's caused by excessive sodium chloride infusions, so you could be getting too much normal saline. Head injuries can cause it, hypernatremia, dehydration, because what do we say dehydration was? Fluid loss with an elevated sodium. Severe diarrhea, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, hyperparathyroidism, and some medications. Now, what we will see typically is um, tachypnea, fast breathing, um, lethargy, weakness, rapid deep respirations, that's that tachypnea, hypertension, and they'll have cognitive changes because remember this is with um, sodium. A lot of times they'll have a normal anion gap though <clears throat> because why? The sodium is balancing out. The sodium is a positive charge. The chloride is a negative charge so they're balancing each other out so that anion gap will be normal. What we want to do is to restore electrolyte and fluid balance. We want to give them lactated ringers and not sodium chloride, right? We may want to give them sodium bicarbonate to help bring down that chloride or some diuretics. Um, but often you'll see these patients getting lactated ringers in the hospital. And then we're going to assess, we're going to teach them about their diet and about um, staying hydrated. So here's a question for you. You're called to your patient's room by a family member who voices concerns about the patient's status. On assessment, you find that the patient is tachypnic, lethargic, weak, and exhibiting a diminished cognitive ability. You also find 3 plus pitting edema. Oh, what does that make you think? 
What electrolyte imbalance would you suspect? Hypercalcemia, hyponatremia, hyperchloremia, or hypophosphatemia? And I think that answer is pretty obvious. The signs and symptoms of hyperchloremia are the same as those of metabolic acidosis, hypervolemia, and hypernatremia. Tachypnic, weakness, lethargy, deep rapid respirations, diminished cognitive abilities, and hypertension occur. If untreated, hyperchloremia can lead to decrease in cardiac output. You hear that? Decrease in cardiac output, decreased perfusion, dysrhythmias, and coma. A high chloride level is accompanied by a high sodium level and fluid retention, which is why your patient had that pitting edema. Option A is incorrect. With hypercalcemia, you would expect tetany. Option B is incorrect. There would not be edema with hyponatremia. Option D is incorrect. Signs and symptoms of hypophosphatemia are mainly neurological in origin. So I know this is a lot of information. Ooh, I know you're overwhelmed. I can't even imagine um, the questions that are going through your mind right now. As always, um, as you cipher through this information and look at it again for a second time, if you come up with any questions that you have or some things you're just not sure about and you want some further clarification, please don't hesitate to send me an email or Make an appointment with me during my office hours and we can come and talk about it and hopefully make sure that you have a clear understanding about fluid and electrolyte imbalance.